What's that? A little louder? How's that? Okay, I feel like I'm kissing the microphone. So, all right. Thank you. All right. Which pie was the best? Who votes for the blueberry pie? Couple? Three? Four? How about the apple pie? Oh, the same. Four. How about the chocolate pie? Oh, way more. And what else was there? Just those three? All right. Well, chocolate's clearly the winner. So. All right. Well, we're going to start the, the afternoon session while you all settle into a food coma. And this is really the second half of the Habitat and Critters session that started right before lunch. And this afternoon, we're going to concentrate a little more on the critters. So our rapporteur for this is Bob Rowe, and he's going to ask the first question of, of each presenter after they're done. The first presenter is going to be Stephen Hale. He's from EPA, and he's going to talk about the benthic community. Bob will ask a question, and then Jeremy Colley will speak next about the changes he's seen, um, I think based mostly on the troll survey, but other, other things as well. Then we, Bob will ask the next question. Then we will go into the general questions for, for the whole audience. So, here we are ready to go, and Stephen, you're up. How's that? Okay. Yeah. All right, I'm going to be talking about the, uh, the uh, animals that live down in the bottom of the bay, in the mud and on the surface. And um, we, uh, we t tackled this from the standpoint, changes in that from the standpoint of biodiversity, because with the historical data sets, often list of species is the only data you can find. Or if you do have abundance data, often it's hard to compare one data set to another throughout the whole, that whole time series. So biodiversity is a fundamental of the function of ecosystems. And worldwide, the uh, marine biodiversity has been having some declines. Historical ecology studies, such as what I'm going to talk about, provide a way to assess how the stressors uh, affect those and how help remind us about how things used to be. So the bay has a very high uh, benthic biodiversity, um, partially because it's at the northern end of the Virginia Biogeographic Province. And we get species, not only warm temperate ones from there, we also get uh, species from the next province to the north coming around into the bay. We also have a deep uh, east passage here, so we have some, some uh, shelf species that are more, or species more common to the shelves that uh, live in the bay. And we also have some rocky shores that are uh, not that common along the southern New England coast. So we have 21 phyla of uh, invertebrates that live in the bay. This is like 60% of all the animal phyla on the whole planet. And most of them, of course, are uh, your worms and crustaceans and, and mollusks. And of course, all the commercial species are basically arthropods and mollusks. So uh, why do we care about biodiversity? It's because of ecosystem services. And uh, those are essentially the things that nature provides uh, to humans that we uh, humans need and, and desire. And uh, it's commonly broken down into different categories. Provision is the one been talked about a lot today, secondary productions, uh, supporting uh, the shellfish and lobsters and, and so on, and also the, all the other species that provide food for the bottom fish. Uh, but also they, they do important regulating things like alter water filtration, uh, clearing the water, uh, processing human waste and um, scar uh, sequestering carbon. They have cultural value in bird watching or shell collecting that people value. Uh, but importantly, also the supporting uh, services like regulation of biogeochemical bio cycles, of, which is of global, global importance, and uh, providing nursery habitat for young fishes. So our goal in tackling this was to uh, put together a, a, a master species list of every benthic invertebrate that's ever been caught in the, in the base since 1834 was the first record we found. And we can um, 
uh, so compiled a master list and analyzed that list for, for trends. So this is all uh, presence absence data uh, since uh, the earliest record we could find, 1834. If anyone knows anything before that, please let me know. The first guy we found was uh, Joseph Toten, who was chief engineer building Fort Adams. In his spare time as a hobby, he collected, uh, took dredges from the bottom of Newport Harbor and identified several uh, species of mollusks that were new to science. Alexander Agassiz was from the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology and built this marine lab, uh, which is uh, down in Newport. Um, this is what it used to be when he was there. This is what it is now. It's behind the inn at Castle Hill. If you go back there, this is uh, Agassiz's old lab. So he and his students collected uh, many species from the bay. And another guy important is uh, E. Verrill from Yale, who uh, teamed up with the U.S. Fish Commission, the uh, forerunner of uh, National Marine Fisher Service, and did a lot of trawls around the whole area because um, he was looking, they were mainly interested in invertebrates from the standpoint of uh, food for fish. They wanted to see what was there for the bottom fish to eat. Uh, one last one is uh, Ernest Barnes at, uh, in 1906 up at the Wickford Lab, put together a list of the mollusks in there against Bay, and 100, 144 he found. And why all this is important is because, uh, as been mentioned earlier by Tom and, and Wally, uh, around the late 1800s, the sewage uh, from Providence, so the Industrial Revolution got rolling in, in full steam, and the human population in the watershed was uh, increasing. And uh, so it's good to have this data pre, pre well, not actually by 1834, there's already, you know, already a change of baseline because of the changes in the watershed, cutting all the trees down and and some early textile uh, metals, et cetera. But it's as good as we can get about 1834, mid-1800s before the Industrial Revolution really took off. So uh, we have almost 2,000 uh, stations in the bay where someone pulled out a, a benthic invertebrate. And this is basically the story. Um, as the Industrial Revolution got rolling, the biodiversity, this is a, a measure of biodiversity, went down, down, down. And then around time 1970s, when we had the environmental legislation, the Clean Water Act, and uh, and uh, the uh, pretreatment program in the 80s, that's kind of climbed back up, maybe with a with a lag. But this is uh, this trend back up. We uh, is we're not you know we need to meet a little bit more data to see how really significant that is. So um, looking at some of the stressors. As the watershed population went up and, and nitrogen inputs and metals into the bay, uh, the taxonomic distinctness, biodiversity went down, and as those things went down, the taxonomic came back up. Now, I'm going to talk about just quickly about another monitoring program, because I think this one is useful for uh, looking at the question of pre- and post-nitrogen reduction, because it started in 1990, and it's a very consistent program, random stations all around the bay, collect a lot of ancillary sediment, uh, physical and chemical data, and uh, it's continuing. And it's, uh, the question, so the story there, looking at biodiversity, there wasn't much change, not much change, wasn't significant change. There's a potential rise back here after 2005, which uh, you know, was a time of uh, a big nitrogen reduction, but um, we need more, more years of data to see whether this, this Rise. Will this will continue or not? So, what was controlling the distribution of, of the variance of these stations was the pollution parameters, mostly sediment contaminants, uh, eutrophication indicators. And then I uh, looked at two spaces, in the, two places in the bay, uh, James, North Jamestown, which is sort of a classic benthic site for benthic studies, which is uh, right off the north end of Jamestown here, and that. That was also the reference site for the Merle mesocosm, so nothing changed there. Um, really, not much of a significant change, and a slight change in community composition, but not in biodiversity. So basically, that makes a good reference site. And compared that one with Spar Island up in Mount Hope Bay, which has uh, the Taunton River, a lot more impacts, the Fall River, City of Fall River, uh, the Brayton Point Power Plant. And there, the, uh, so the biodiversity just crashed. It just goes down, down, down over, the, over this time series. So one of the longest time series of benthic studies in the bay was here in Spar Island, or in the, from the power plant. Uh, also, big change in the community composition up there. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go quickly over uh, the stresses here because I think Molly and Tom covered those pretty well, but um, certainly eutrophication hypoxia is a big thing affecting the benthos. 
uh, that fish kill of 2003 just reminded everybody it took a lot of invertebrates as well as the fish. Uh, the, in the week after, there was just lots and lots of uh, soft shell clams washing up on the beaches. And uh, briefly, what's happening, this is a kind of a conceptual diagram of how things go with eutrophication it goes, as it goes this way. Uh, you get this uh, anoxic sediments go higher and higher. You lose your deep, uh, long-lived species. You get shallow living species. These are photos cross-section of the profile. These are little amphipod tubes. And when it goes totally anoxic up into the water column, you get these sulfur bacteria on the surface, like this is from the Province River, this core. And so what happened, expect as the uh, eutrophication hypoxia are reduced and go the other direction, it's going to go this direction, and that the species are going to come back up. That'll be the prediction. So uh, just the thing, so as some of these stressors have gone down, others have come up. Um, metals is one that has gone down as a stressor over the years. Invasive species is one that's coming up. There's more, more uh, problems with this. And of course, the population of the watershed, we have more sewage, more impervious surface, more runoff, stormwater runoff. And uh, of course, temperature, which the direct effect on the benthos is that there's a, a lot of, uh, we're losing some of the cold species moving north and we're gaining species from the south. That changes the community composition here, uh, which has, you know, it's gonna have some drastic effects. So, think about a time. Um, it's high biodiversity. Uh, though it's steadily lost a lot from the Industrial Revolution and, and uh, population, human population. Um, the primary cause seems to be eutrophication, hypoxia, and sediment contamination. It has serious implications for the, the biodiversity, uh, I mean the ecosystem services that I showed earlier. And, uh, but hopeful, a hopeful sign that it, it does appear to have a partial recovery uh, after the 1970s, 80s. So we need a, a little bit more data to really be sure about that. So thank you. So, so Steve, you, you, um, we don't really have biomass data to, to work with, abundance, but um, the, the biodiversity data seems to be rather stable, but you talked about shifts in composition, and, it, and the primary driver for that would be the change in temperature that we've experienced. Well, it's all those things, the, all the stressors, the hypoxia, trophication, metals, uh, sediment contaminants, and temperature rises. Yeah, but um, the biodiversity, uh, the sediment, con uh, if, if I had a research question, it would be, um, we, we know very little about second benthic secondary production. So these are the guys that are not only providing the shellfish, but also providing the food for all the bottom fish. We know almost nothing about the secondary production. It's hardly ever been measured in the bay. Um, and uh, so it, some people have, you can calculate it from biomass, but we all have almost no biomass data for the benthic invertebrates. So if I was designing a monitoring program, I would put those two things in, in the, into the mix. Thank you, Steve. Next we have Jeremy Colley. As soon as we can pull up his presentation. Make sure, uh, can you hear me all right at the back of the auditorium? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, uh, I'm, good afternoon. And uh, if Steve Hale counts the worms, my lab counts the critters that have scales and carapaces. So I want to acknowledge the help of Joe Langdon and Joe Zottoli. The Joe's made a really beautiful poster. I hope you had a chance to look at it during lunchtime because I'm gonna have to go through this material fairly quickly. Okay, so I want a little, little shout out to the Graduate School of Oceanography Fish Trawl. I want to show you some results from that. And first of all, I'll talk about the, the reason that we do it. It was started by the founder of GSO, Charles Fish, who was interested in the seasonal use of Narragansett Bay by fish species. It was continued by the late Perry Jeffries, who, who built that seasonal survey into one of the longest running time series of fish abundance that exists. And since I've arrived, I've been interested in how environmental drivers are uh, influencing the fish patterns that we've seen. And I must say that this morning I've already got some very interesting ideas and questions and hypotheses about what may be driving the patterns that we see. So as far as the, the methods, uh, we sample once a week. Uh, we've been doing this since 1959. So that means that there have been over 2,800 
uh, sampling events and counting. We sampled two sites in Narragansett Bay. I've identified them here um, in blue, Fox Island, um, and uh, red is the Whale Rock site. So I'm, I call that the Fox Island Inner Bay, and uh, Whale Rock is the Outer Bay. It's right at the edge of the bay. And um, some of you may have different names for these zones, but I'm going to try to be consistent about my appellation. And it, um, Fox Island will be in blue and Whale Rock in red, uh, except when it's not. So we, we conduct hydrographic information at the sites, and mainly we, we collect the abundance, weight, and length measurements of all the fish and invertebrates who catch. Since I've been at GSO, we've been trying to modernize the survey at the same time maintaining the standardized measurements that uh, have been done all along. So I'm going to jump right into some of the data. We've collected a lot of data, and uh, we've analyzed it from very different perspectives, and I'll show you a few of those perspectives this afternoon. So one way we look at the data is to take all the species and group them in, group them by where they live in the habitat and uh, by their taxonomy. So we see we have demersal fish, that's the, the light color there, and uh, this is at Fox Island. So you can see at the start of the survey, the community was very much dominated by demersal fish. Perry Jeffries noted that the, the increase in invertebrate species, these are benthic invertebrates, but the big shift you see that was in around 1980, this transition to uh, pelagic species in blue, and also the rise of the squid in uh, what's called coral there. This, um, this shift is even more apparent at the Whale Rock Station, where you can see that shift occurring in about the 1980s and persisting to the present day. So we see these big shifts in the species composition. So you might wonder, well, which species are, are really responsible for these changes? Here we, we've presented them as a proportion of the total. And so we can look and see, well, which species are driving these changes? This uh, plot shows the, the rate of increase or decrease of the top 25 species. So look at these changes relative to zero, which means the species has not changed in abundance at all. If it's to the right of that, these are the winner species. And you can see that the species that have increased are the ones like butterfish, squid, uh, cancer crabs, four-spot flounder, uh, striped sea robin, etc. So these are typically the uh, warm water species. The species, the losers on the left here, are species like uh, cunner, northern sea robin, winter flounder, sea stars, horseshoe crabs, hakes. So these are typically the cool water species. Note that there are very few species right in the middle of the graph, meaning that there's been no overall change in abundance. We only have red hake and a herring here. So what it means is there are very few species that are, that are standing still, or I guess I should say that they're swimming in place. All these species are either increasing or decreasing. And to put that in perspective, this, uh, if you look at the top axis there, the proportional change, this would mean that this species has increased 100 times in abundance, and these species like Cunner and Longhorn Sculpin have decreased their 1% like their now of what they were originally when we started the survey. So these are really big changes. And they're of course, species abundance does not change smoothly over time. We can't just measure a rate of increase. We have to look at the actual bumps and peaks over time. So here we've pulled out for nine of the important species their complete time series. And again, the blue is Fox Island, the red is Whale Rock. And you can see that some of the cold water species like winter flounder, they've had peaks in abundance, so they've declined to very low levels, to tog, with very low abundance, but it seems to be making a comeback. Silver hake, um, very much lower. In contrast, we see some of the warmer water species like summer flounder, which has increased a lot. Um, this is a, a management success. And then you can see things like scup, which are more abundant now, but still have a lot of interannual variability. Uh, butterfish as well. Finally, I point out the invertebrates. The, many of the invertebrate species are typically episodic. You can see that lobster, uh, we're certainly concerned about the low abundance of lobster in the bay now, but at the start of this, the time series, uh, we virtually caught no lobsters. Um, cancer crabs as well. You can see that cancer crabs typically are, are quite episodic in their abundance, and the same with longfin squid, which peaked in the mid-1990s. So when you see data like this, it's difficult to make sense of it all and say, well, what's, what's going on? What's the overall pattern? And so we tend to calculate... Um, community indices. And so the top right then is showing well, what's the total numbers per toe 
that we've caught in the fish trawl since we started. And you can see the numbers at Whale Rock and, and Fox Island are fairly comparable. Uh, it looks like the numbers went up and kind of peaked in the mid-90s, maybe have gone down since then. On the top right, I show the spring uh, summer temperature time series, SST. You've seen these before. And uh, these are in uh, degrees Celsius. And I understand that um, here in America we use Fahrenheit, but um, I'm, from on, I'm from Canada, and we adopted the metric system in the 1970s, so that's my excuse. But uh, this in, the increase in temperature, um, depending on who you ask, is approximately 1.7 degrees Celsius, which equates to 3 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the interesting thing is we plot the preferred temperature of each species. And by preferred temperature, it's the average of the preferred temperatures of a fish species weighted by their abundance. So if you have more warm water species, the average preferred temperature goes up. So each point is the average preferred temperature of the community that year, and I plotted the trend lines. The interesting thing is that those trend lines almost match the increase in temperature exactly, which means that the fish community is responding to the temperature increase. You see also that there are some wavy purple lines there, and this is the opportunity for Walter to get up and do his dance thing. But the, the waves there are driven by the fact that when the preferred temperature goes down, uh, winter flounder was abundant. When the preferred temperature goes up, that's when the scup are more abundant. <clears throat> so um, following this idea of preferred temperature, another way to group the species is to group them into bins depending on which species on their, on their preferred temperature. So these go from um, 7 to 10 degrees, the cool water species in blue, all the way up to the warm water species in red. And you can see over time there's been a clear decline in the cool water species uh, and an increase in the warmer water species, particularly in this 13 to 15 degree bin there. You see this also um, occurring at the Whale Rock Station, decline in cool water species, increase in warm water species. So I think that that's a pretty clear pattern. So far, I've just been talking about the numbers of species, and so I want to say one thing about biomass, because biomass is what's important to the food web. So here are trend, the plots of the biomass um, at the Fox Island site and the Outer Bay. And you can see that the biomass has been, you know, if it's more or less constant, that means that the productivity of the bay is being maintained. The thing that you really see here, though, is that the biomass in the, in the winter months, and winter here is November to April, has really declined. So the consumer biomass is increasingly concentrated now in the summer months as opposed to the winter. Uh, one point I want to make is, is Narragansett Bay unique, or are these similar patterns being seen in other estuaries? Uh, we tend to be quite parochial in Rhode Island. I know there are people who have never left Rhode Island. And <laughs> And so I think it's a good idea to look at our neighboring estuaries and see, for comparison, to see whether the same patterns are, are occurring there. So these are two figures from a paper by Rich Bell showing trends in winter flounder abundance on the right, summer flounder abundance on the left, and our data are here in the middle. And you can look and see, well, if we look in Connecticut, you see a decline. Uh, Virginia, the winter flounder are doing a little bit better in the nymphs survey offshore. Same thing for summer flounder. You see the same, pretty much the same bumps and peaks in the neighboring estuaries. So it suggests that either the drivers are kind of coastwide, or we have the similar types of processes occurring in neighboring estuaries. So I think that's informative. This is kind of a, a schematic diagram of what Candace was describing about our paradigm for what we think is going on. And, um, I'll just describe it briefly, but basically this was a, a picture that was in the, the Boston Globe. It was saying that with, with, without the strong winter-spring bloom, we have um, less of the uh, production is sinking to the bottom. There's more consumption occurring in the, in the water column, less going to the bottom to feed the, these um, benthic invertebrates, and so that we have a shift basically from a, a benthic-dominated community to a pelagic-dominated community. That's kind of our working hypothesis about how the changes in temperature are actually amplified in the food web. So to conclude, so total abundance of biomass and fish invertebrates has remained fairly constant 
although you might have noticed maybe it's declining in the, in the most recent decade. Uh, however, the species composition has shifted really drastically. We've seen a shift from uh, demersal fish species to invertebrates and also a shift from benthic uh, species to pelagic ones. The temperature has increased by, I'll say, about 2 degrees C. Uh, and the preferred temperature of the fish community has also increased to keep pace with the water temperature. Uh, the total consumer biomass is increasingly concentrated in the summer months and much less in the winter. And the species phenology, that means the timing of the migrations, is shifting even more than the temperature uh, change would suggest. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Um, Jeremy, I guess it's somewhat reassuring that we're having these broad scale shifts and they're not just limited to Rhode Island. Um, I really miss the winter flounder, uh, great favorite catch of mine. Is it uh, moved north? Is it more uh, predominantly uh, the center of the species distribution now north of us? Is that where it's gone or is it just gone coastwide? Yeah, thanks. It's good. That's a very good question. And um, so I. There's quite a bit of evidence that population densities, our center of mass, have shifted to the north. I think we have to be clear about what's happening, because you kind of think about these lobsters, you know, walking all the way from here. I mean, lobsters can walk a long way, but that's not actually what's going on. And it's particularly true for the winter flounder. The winter flounder stocks on Georgia's Bank and the Gulf of Maine are actually in better shape, but it, th those aren't Rhode Island winter flounder. It means that the, that the conditions for their reproduction and productivity are better there than they are here. So. There is stock structure. Our stocks are going down. Their stocks are going up. Now we'll op open the uh, questions up to the audience. And right over here, uh, Mason. It's on now. It's on now. Uh, my question is for Stephen. Um, I thought it was interesting, the slide that you had on the good mud versus the bad mud. And uh, I'm wondering if once the mud turns anoxic and so-called bad mud, is there any track back to the good mud that we all love? So he was asking if, if there's a difference between the good mud and the bad mud, the slide that you have with the hypoxic mud, and is there a way to get back to oxic mud conditions once we've gone hypoxic? Oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yes, <clears throat> two ways. One is the reduction of uh, the or organic carbon coming into the bay, which part of the problem is not just the hypoxia. It's also, uh, it was the organic carbon coming in, which has high organic carbon in the sediments which causes lots of different issues, but also as the uh, nitrogen goes down, hypoxia improves, and also total organic carbon in the sediment lowers. I expect that we will get yeah more, more species back up in that upper bay. Does that answer? Yeah. Uh, yes. More questions? <laughs> All right, I have, actually have two questions, one for Steve and one for Jeremy. Um, Steve, you, you talked a lot about how the species composition has changed over time. I'm wondering if you could um, speak a little bit to which species are accounting for those changes. So are those large changes in um, phyla and genus, or w what, what species are changing or have changed over time? Please do. I, 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 think, uh, I think Anna's question was about looking at changes in the benthic communities. Was I, I think you know which species or species groups are driving these changes? Uh huh. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, we did. We did uh, for the community composition changes. It can vary a lot uh, from year to year because of these small opportunistic species like the little amphipods, uh, small polychaetes, capital or. Uh, medium mastus, they can uh, change in abundance uh, ra rapidly from year to year. 
has a huge mass of the amphipods and then they get wiped out in a winter storm or, or they, some evidence are expanding now into the Providence River. Um, but those, those uh, small guys that are very opportunistic, short-lived, um, and typically pollution tolerant are, are the ones that are driving most of the changes. So we're seeing more of those opportunistic species in our Bendit community. more opportunistic. Um, yeah, I mean, we used to call back in the 70s when a lot of this work was started in North Jamestown that it was a nuclear nephthys community, a little small clam and a, and a big wor a worm because those are the dominant species. And then somewhere in there, in that time period, it kind of, we started learning about mediomastis, which is a small polychaete, very opportunistic. And that was, Jeff Frisson, who did some of this early work, thought that that was taking over because the organic matter was going up a lot, and they were much more able to deal with organic matter. And in our recent data, we just looked at who's the most dominant in that, and from the, the EPA data set, and uh, it's still, Mediomastis is still the, one of the dominant species. So, yeah, it hasn't yet gone back to what it used to be back prior to the 70s, anyway. Thank you. And Jeremy, in your, your figure of preferred temperature over time. So there was an increase in preferred temperature for species, warm water, warm water species, but there was also an apparent increase in very warm tolerant species, it looked like. Warm water. Sorry, very cold tolerant species. Sorry, could you repeat that in? So in your figure of preferred temperature, there was an apparent. Or maybe uh, we should turn back to that figure. It's okay. I can talk to you about it afterwards. <laughs> Never mind. Additional questions? This question's for Jeremy. Uh, in an earlier presentation, Candace had correlated at least some of the uh, decrease in, in decapod abundance and benthic invertebrate abundance to the decrease in the winter spring bloom and decrease in nutrient loading in the in the benthic substrates. How does that uh, fit into your um, fish trawl data that you've been seeing, and how does that correlate with temperature? Yeah, uh, th that's a good question. I noticed that too. I, I guess the, the main thing would be to note that over time there have been episodes of high abundance and low abundance in these crustacean species. So it's a little bit risky, I think, to take a snapshot of, of one decade and to make inferential inferences about that without fully understanding uh, what's driving the dynamics, which unfortunately we don't really, we can't, we can't really say at this point. Okay. Um, while Sally takes the microphone up there, I'm gonna ask Jeremy a question. So as I looked at your chart, um, I noticed of the species that are that are here, I noticed that black sea bass were not on that chart. And given the input that we hear from the um, recreational fishing community, the commercial fishing community, be about black the increase in black sea bass, I'm just curious as to why they weren't on that chart, or did I just totally miss it? <laughs> no, that's a good question. I think we haven't maybe caught up with the with the times. Uh, we, we, it, this is kind of a vestige of the Perry Jeffries era when he had his top 25 favorites. And so black sea bass, in a way, although they're, they're more abundant than they used to be, they haven't kind of made it to the, the top 25 list. In our, but, but certainly, uh, thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, we should pay more attention to that. <laughs> understand uh, the winter flounder decrease, okay, like, like uh, Bob said, uh, they're one of my uh, favorite species, or they used to be, um, and, and now we don't see them in Narragansett Bay. Um, and so I understand that with increasing temperatures, we're seeing um, some predator, possibly, who's interfering with the, uh, the development at some stage of their life cycle. However, um, I don't understand why that predator wasn't present, let's just say, in New Jersey or, or Delaware 
uh, when they had the same temperature regime that we have now. Um, and I'm wondering if that predator, is that an invasive species? Is it something that's been introduced uh, into um, the, the coast-wide uh, estuary uh, systems? Okay, yeah, that's a really good question. And um, as Dean Carlos was saying, that we have, um, we have questions, we don't necessarily have the answers. But I think you're, we're very concerned with winter flounder and they're, they're still our favorite species. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll give you a general answer and a specific one. The thing about the predators, I mean, it's, it's really um, tempting to point the finger at a predator when you see them, you know, preying on juvenile fish and say, aha, you know, that's the problem. And I think a lot of us are looking for kind of a single explanation when actually there's, there's multiple explanations for, for in, uh, increases in survivals. My more general answer is that we're, we have a, um, a research project now funded by Rhode Island Sea Grant where we're looking at a stage-specific analysis of winter flounder in the bay where we can actually look at what the survival, changes in survival at each life history stage to pinpoint where the uh, survival has decreased. And, and right now, preliminary results suggest that it's actually the winter time. It's the, the, the first and second winter of their life that seems to be survival bottleneck. So that should help us point to um, you know, what might be the, the actual agents of mortality or the causes of that mortality. And it, but it's likely to be not just one, but, but several actually. And we should have results of that within the next year that we can share. So Jerry, I might have missed this, but did you say, how did you determine whether a species was a warm water species versus a cold water species? And was that done with the data from this data set or with outside data? Yeah, that's, that's a good question, because there's always the, the risk of circular reasoning here, where you, you measure the temperature at which you catch the species and say, ah, that's its preference. We're using independent estimates of what their temperature, you know, the range of temperature and kind of the, the median temperature of where they occur. And so those preferences are, in a sense, independent of the data that we collect. Yeah. Hey, Jeremy. Um, so you showed productivity or reference productivity in terms of biomass and, and how that might be an also uh, interesting component to think about when we, th when we discuss ecosystem changes. And I'm wondering, when thinking more on the species level, should there be certain species, uh, in your opinion, from an ecosystem framework that we should be focused on in terms of evaluating true indicator species for Narragansett Bay, um, both, I guess, perhaps more historically as well as from a uh, ecosystem perspective? So if I understand your question, you're saying what are the indicator species? Or what, what may they be, in your opinion? Oh, the winter flounder. It's the poster fish for Narragansett Bay. I guess, uh, um, but more in, when thinking about how the ecosystem is changing, should there be other additional species that we should also look to now as the system changes? Okay, I wasn't trying to be facetious. What I, what, what I wanted to say, and I kind of was a little pressed for time, is when you look at the fish community and how it's changed, it's basically shifted from resident species to summer visitors. It's kind of like our towns where we live, when you look at the house next door. You know, it used to be a year-round residence and now it's a summer re visitor. That's kind of what's happening with our fish community. And so I think we should be concerned about the, the residents because they're the ones, the populations that are actually, you know, evolved here. And so from a conservation perspective, but I think from a productivity and also from a fisheries perspective, we need to also start thinking about what the summer migrants are doing as well. Jeremy, I like that, um, shifting from residents to tourists. Uh, <laughs> it's a nice analogy. Any more questions? All right. Well, um, thank you for your questions. Thank you for your presentations. Oh, they're, they're, on the, they're on the skids. We're going to change the agenda a little bit. We're not going to take a break since you guys, or do you guys want a break? Or do we keep want to move? Let's keep moving. All right, so we're going to have the next session. And go ahead.
while we're getting set up for the next session, I just wanted to bring everybody's attention to this amazing um, sketch that was done on the chalkboard. I believe Chris Kincaid is responsible for this. Chris, are you here? Matt Damon for the sketch. Thank you for doing that, and it's uh, it's wonderful. Do you, uh, you want to say anything about what inspired the, what the sketch? Yeah. I think John's Thank you so much. Okay, we're gonna get started with our next session. Uh, my name is Teresa Crean. I am a Coastal Research Associate with the Coastal Resources Center here at GSO. I'm also an Extension Specialist with Rhode Island Sea Grant. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our next panel who will talk about expectations for the future and as Wally said this morning, of a complex and diverse Narragansett Bay. So we're gonna start off with um, Professor John King. He's a professor of geological oceanography here at GSO. And he will talk about um, how much of this change is climate related. And then Wally will extend her comments from this morning um, and expand upon the grand challenge and grand opportunity uh, in terms of how we can be on the forefront of quantifying the impacts of a changing climate and de decreased nutrient loading in the Bay. And our rapporteur for this session is Wenley Ferguson, who is the Director of Habitat Restoration for Save the Bay. So we'll have both speakers do their piece. We'll have Wenley ask a question of both of them, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Thank you. John. Okay, I'm going to attempt to answer this impossible to answer question. Uh, and I, I was instructed that I'm supposed to be hopeful in, uh, in my approach to this. As many of you know, that uh, when I give talks on this, uh, usually people uh, leave the talks feeling like they had lived at Chernobyl for a number of years after <laughs> it blew up. So. So just a little bit of background, you know, uh, basically what drives this whole discussion, it's what I would classify as settled science, despite what uh, some would tell you. And basically what we have here are various, uh, I guess the pointer doesn't work, uh, various scenarios. You know, you've got your high-end scenario of greenhouse gas inputs to the atmosphere, Oh. Okay, um, so you've got your high-end scenarios of greenhouse gas uh, inputs to the atmosphere and they kind of go up into the, the gray range on that diagram. And then you have your, your low range, which are sort of cast in blue. And here's me being hopeful. Uh, I hope like hell we don't end up in the gray area because if we do, we're just kind of rearranging some deck chairs here today then uh, if we end up in that area, it's all about climate change. Climate change is going to obliterate other signals. I don't think that uh, there will be many 
discussions anymore about, okay, how important are nutrients? Right now, it's a combination, and they're both pretty important. Uh, the high-end scenarios, I don't, I don't think nutrients are going to be that important anymore. Most of the change is going to be driven by climate. So let's assume that we're going to end up on one of these low-end scenarios. So that's me being hopeful. I hope we do. <laughs> so um, the sorts of changes that are driven, the, these are <laughs> modeled results. And the models are actually pretty good. You know, basically the whole idea about greenhouse gases, it's physics and chemistry. And the modeling is a little more esoteric than that. Um, the models work pretty well for air temperature. And you can kind of see the, uh, the high-end scenarios in red and the low-end scenarios in blue. Uh, they tend to underestimate for sea level change. Uh, so these are not strictly model results. These are model results adjusted by NOAA. But you can kind of see that the, uh, the high-end results were, were sort of looking at 11 feet on average of sea level uh, change in Rhode Island by 2100. Um, I don't think anyone believes that we're going to get any of the low end scenarios with sea level. Most of the optimistic estimates are more like five or six feet of sea level change by 2100. Uh, with respect to precipitation, we're looking at probably about a 30% increase mostly in winter and spring precipitation by 2100. And then uh, in addition to that, we're going to get droughts in the late summer and uh, fall. So precipitation is going to become uh, overall higher, but the distribution of it across the year is going to be much more extreme. So um, let's hope we end up on the lowercase scenario. Now, I want to, I want to talk about some work that we did that's uh, something a little bit different. And this is work that uh, has occurred in, uh, in, in my lab. And basically, we study dated sediment cores. This is uh, some work that we did in the Narrow River or the Petaquamskit River, which is a very simple system. And it revealed some pretty interesting things about the relationship between climate change and productivity. The Narrow River is uh, in the middle basin. It's roughly 60-some uh, feet deep, but only the upper few feet say the upper 10 feet are oxygenated. And it's really, really um, well stratified. Those layers don't mix very often. And living right below where the oxygen doesn't penetrate in the narrow river is a thing called the green sulfur bacteria. And the green sulfur bacteria produces something called bacterial chlorophyll E. It's a particular type of chlorophyll. What makes this system unique is that there's no grazing. Nothing can get. Uh, into that um, anoxic zone to eat the green sulfur bacteria. So what sinks to the bottom and goes into the sediments is a function of temperature. And what we've seen is that if you look at the last millennium, uh, and the dating on this, it also forms annual layers that are kind of like tree rings, which we count. So the age model on this is as good as it gets. And basically what we see is the biological laminations are thicker in the medieval warm period. So you get more kind of primary productivity, if you will. We'll lump the bacteria in with the phytoplankton for this discussion. You get a little more productivity on average when it's warmer, when you don't have to consider who's eating the phytoplankton. Um, when it's colder, like in the Little Ice Age, you get a little less productivity. The layers aren't as thick. And then when you get into the um, modern warm period, which also has excess nutrients, eutrophication, that's where the layers get the thickest. So when you have both warm climate and a little bit of fertilizer added to the system, that's when the productivity seems to take off the most. The other thing that's sort of interesting about this study is these squiggly lines uh, and the thing on the top, it's called a wavelet analysis. You're, you're essentially extracting from the data what are the dominant periods of uh, climate change? And what we see is that the dominant period during the Little Ice Age, it's got a cycle that's about 100 years. So that's a very different behavior. When we get into these warmer periods, um, the dominant behavior is an eight-year cycle of the North Atlantic Oscillation, which has a warm and a cold phase. And then we have something called the multi-decadal 
oscillation, also in the North Atlantic, which is significantly warmer. Uh, and, well, has warm faces, but it, it's several decades, and it has various periods. So when we look up uh, what's going on recently, we see an eight-year cycle in the NO, NAO, and we see about a 20-year cycle and a 40-year cycle in that decadal oscillation. And you can kind of filter this record and say, okay, here the, here's what uh, happens during the warm, here's what happens during the cold, and you can reconstruct that back in time. And the thing that's nice about this is that I'm going to make my <coughs> pitch for monitoring here. Basically because you can predict the behavior of the system at a pretty high level, and you can see what happens to the system during the warm period, uh, even though we've got this increasing trend projecting out into the future, we're going to be able to look at the extremes in the record and tell what's going to happen on average in about 10 years. Now, that doesn't give us a lot of time to respond, but if you're monitoring everything carefully, you're going to know what's going to happen on average about 10 years before it actually happens. So the, uh, the predictable uh, features of the, of the system also give me a little bit of hope that we can plan a little for the scenarios that are coming. Now, uh, what? Okay. All right. I better rush. Uh, now, basically, reconstructions have been back, uh, dug back in time. And one thing that's sort of interesting, this is all based on historical information. You just kind of see that as we go back uh, to pre-European settlement time, it just looks like things are good and they stay good. Well, if you do these cores, you, you look at the behavior of the system, and um, doesn't look like there's any strong relationship with climate, although this is a proxy for diatom productivity. And it looks like during the warm intervals, you get slightly more diatom productivity. And it's got about a 400-year beat to it. But then you get up to European settlement time, and it looks like the diatoms become much less important and other things become important. And these things are all proxies for productivity. They're chemical measures that we can do in the sediments. And basically, when nitrogen and carbon gets really high and the uh, delta N15 increases, that means the system is pretty strongly eutrophied. And you can see that the early stages of eutrophication occurred kind of starting around the early 1800s up until about uh, 1900, and then it took off again. And one thing I heard earlier, and this is an important point, so grant me just a little space. Um, yeah, ba basically, th this morning, I heard people talking about the climate system as if it behaved linearly, that if it changed X amount in a certain time frame and it only changed half that much in the next X number of years, that that couldn't do anything major. There are thresholds on the climate system, and if you exceed the thresholds, big changes can happen with relatively small changes. It's kind of the cumulative effect. And when you go through one of these thresholds, big things happen. Biological systems behave the same way. So let's not think about these things as behaving literally. That'll get us in trouble. But we do have these proxies. And what, what we see um, is that the sediments are loaded with nutrients. And Bruce, they're not refractory. These things interact with the water column. And they can go back up into the system. So another important point is there's going to be a lag in the response between what the wastewater treatment facilities do and what happens. And it's due to this bank of nutrients that are in the sediments. Now, the final point is that uh, what do we want? What's our end game here? What do we want the bay to be? Because if, if you look at this diagram, which looks at macrofossils in the sediment core in Greenwich Cove, you can kind of see that things really changed uh, significantly um, starting in late 1700s up until about 1900. So if you go over there to the scallops, that's Scallop Town. That was sort of the optimum condition, I think, in some people's opinion. And if you look at all the indicators of eutrophication, that's not a pristine system. A pristine system is kind of down here. And the productivity of the pristine system is not as high, and it's different. It's diatoms instead of other things. 
the slightly eutrophied system looks like the one that has the most biological productivity. So to get to the point that the fishing community uh, has raised, you know, we exceeded a threshold in about 1900 that changed things a lot for the worse. It kind of went from scallops and a lot of eelgrass to softshell clams and quahogs. And Steve Granger said something about sulfitic sediments killing eelgrass. Well, the sulfitic sediments came in when you had all those nutrients in, in the sediment column, and the eelgrass was pretty much done in by that. Uh, if we get back to scallop town time, we didn't have the sulfitic sediments, and we had a community more like what we considered desirable. If you go further back in time, then you're going to get into something that, in, in, uh, to an environmentalist, might be optimal, but to a fisherman might not be optimal. So I think we need to address this question of where do we want to end up on this? Okay? That's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you, John. And now we're going to turn it over to uh, Wally to talk about what does this all mean and where are we going? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to, for those of us um, who are here this morning, I'm going to pick off from where I sort of ended there, um, and I'm going to ask us to sort of own this grand challenge and opportunity, um, and the grand challenge and opportunity that I have been presenting here is I think we have a chance to be one of the first estuaries in the nation to go ahead and work together to quantify the impacts of changing climate and decreased nutrient loading, two major human interventions. And I think this is an exciting opportunity um, because we could lead, we could lead the, the field and sort of direct how, not only how um, to answer the question, but sort of what the, what the results might be for other estuaries. <clears throat> So there's a paper by Carlos Duarte. Um, it's called Return to Neverland. You guys remember Peter Pan? Yes, OK. So oh, of course, right? So um, in, in this idea of Return to Neverland, Carlos Duarte and, and co-authors looked at a series of ecosystems and tried to say, if we're going to take management intervention and reduce nutrient loading, can we expect that ecosystem to go back to whatever it was when we first started measuring? And he has um, these four different options. So for example, um, here we have increasing nutrient inputs on the bottom and then increasing chlorophyll on our y-axis. And we see this option here where somehow we, you know, we magically decrease nutrients and things go back perfectly to what it was in the past. And that's, that's Peter Pan, right? We can, we can sort of kiss kiss that option goodbye, but we can be hopeful. Um, and then there's this idea of a regime shift or maybe a shifting baseline that there's a lot of things that have changed in the background. And that would certainly apply here to Narragansett Bay, where you have both shifting baselines and regime shifts. And the whole goal of this paper that they present is trying to ask, what can we expect? <clears throat> And so they looked at four different systems in Europe, um, in a Danish estuary, the Baltic Sea, the North Sea, and the Dutch Wadden Sea. And this is all chlorophyll, so these sort of match this theoretical model here. These are all chlorophyll and Y, and then the total nitrogen inputs. And you can see that it's a very jagged, jagged line, right? Things don't go back perfectly to what, um, to what they were. And so as we approach this question and sort of want to define our baseline, I think it's very important to not only um, you know, what John just said, not only remember that the, the estuary um, that a purist environmentalist might want to go back to in the 1400s or something is quite different than what someone who wants Scallop Town would want. And also, no matter what we want, we need to be realistic that it's not going to be a, a beautiful, even path. And maybe that seems really obvious, but I think it's important to, to highlight. <clears throat> Okay, so if we look at post-European um, contact, and we'll, we read a little bit of William Wood's work on what Narragansett Bay looks like, um, he talks about lobsters, lots of lobsters, 20-pound lobsters. And in case you want to know what that looks like, um, this 20-pound lobster was confiscated from Logan Airport, someone's bag. So, so those are big lobsters. Um, there was also lots of clams and shellfish and other o and oysters. And these were actually, um, sometimes people were eating them, of course, but people were also using them to feed their livestock because there were so many of them, they, they just didn't care. So here is an example of, a, of what Narragansett Bay was, clearly very, very productive, but it didn't have this fertilization that we've been doing to it for the last 100 years. So we got this question earlier this, this morning, how is that possible? If we didn't have all this fertilization, how do we get a 20-pound lobster? And 
and not just one of them, right, but many of them. <clears throat> I certainly don't have the answer, and I'm not going to predict the future for Narragansett Bay, because that would be a fool's errand. Um, but I do think that um, we have some possible hints for what could have gone on. So right now, um, we are used to thinking of Narragansett Bay as being a gradient of primary production driven by nutrient inputs predominantly from um, Providence River and the watershed above us. Um, and as Candace said, you know, that's decreased, but it's still a major source of nutrients. <clears throat> As this, these nutrients are decreasing, I think other sources within the bay are going to become important. Um, so I spend literally a lot of time with my head in the mud. Um, and I've been measuring benthic fluxes in Narragansett Bay for 12 years, um, and we continue to do so. And I think that um, some of the changes that we've seen are quite profound. I won't go into those details, but I'm happy to talk about them at a later date. But what I do think will happen is that we're going to see the benthos being a more important source, um, at least for some time, of nutrients in Narragansett Bay. I think internal recycling is important, and I think that the process called nitrogen fixation is going to begin to dominate in the system. Um, nitrogen fixation is a bacterial-mediated process where bacteria can actually take N2 gas and turn it into a biological usable form, like ammonium, and that can stimulate um, water column and benthic productivity. Um, I also think, and this of course is not an original idea, that there are nutrients coming in from Rhode Island Sound that are going to be very important. Um, this idea was one of Scott Nixon's ideas. Um, it was one of uh, the first project I worked on when I came to work in the lab actually with Steve Granger um, and Scott, and now um, Chris Kincaid and Dave Ullman and Kevin Rosa are all very interested in this, and I'm hoping that we can help solve this, this question, and that is trying to solve how important this source of nutrients will be for, for Narragansett Bay. It obviously Obviously hasn't gone away in the past, um, but now that we're decreasing up here, then this all of a sudden shifts, sort of the proportion of this shifts in, term, in terms of importance. I am not sure this movie's going to work. Can you try to hit play for me? So this is um, Kevin Rose's movie. If you like highlight the thing. Darn it. Okay. Well, it will be, uh, we'll go back one. Thank you. It's a really neat movie, and I'm sorry it's not going to work. Oh, oh there working. it goes. Okay, so what it's showing you here, we have um, density coming in, so this is looking at density. Um, here is the mouth, um, we'll get right over here, the mouth of the East Passage, and so we can see this line coming in here. Um, this is labeled DIN, but really it's a, it's a tracer, so it's not actually dissolved in organic nitrogen, but the idea is to explore how um, when the deep water comes in from Rhode Island Sound, this deep, deep water is full of nutrients. The concentrations of which we, we've looked at in the past, and we need to get back on this, um, but this comes, oh, awesome. Um, it, it comes in, and as it does so, it's going to pump this nutrient-rich water into Narragansett Bay. And I think trying to solve that and figure out how important that is, um, is, is a really essential question for moving forward. So both the benthos and figuring out the offshore sources of nutrients. <clears throat> Okay, so what's next? Well, we have a lot of work to do, and I think we have a lot of work to do as a community. And we've got some really great baselines to, to build off of. So um, the NBEP pro program just produced this fantastic report. If you guys haven't read it, you should. There are 500 some pages, so there's a great summary um, that can, that's available. Um, there are a lot of SAMP management plans and a new one being developed. You're going to hear about this, as well as the Rhode Island NSF EPSCOR program that just got funded to do some work and more work in Narragansett Bay. All of these things you're going to hear about in a little bit, so I will, let, I will let them lie here. But just know that we're really building off this solid foundation. We also have in Narragansett Bay, we're so fortunate to have these long-term monitoring, and I can't emphasize enough how important these are. Without these um, type of monitoring efforts, we would not be in the position we are today. We would not be able to have this workshop and talk about all of the changes, nor would we be able to begin to try to understand and per, uh, what's going to happen in the future. So these are some of the water quality monitoring stations, fixed stations. Um, if you go online, the Narragansett Bay Condition Snapshot is a wonderful tool, um, both for understanding sort of day-to-day -day what's happening in the upper Narragansett Bay, but also as a teaching tool. The long-term phytoplankton time series is literally one of the world's longest running time series. It is an unbelievable resource. I have heard rumors that there might be funding cuts to it. Please, please, please don't do that. Um, without this, we would not understand half of what we understand about Narragansett Bay. <clears throat> um, I showed this plot er earlier today, but these are invaluable data that set the tone in our understanding for how much primary productivity um, is happening in Narragansett Bay and how that's been changing over time. 
I will give a shout out to the fish trawl time series. There's one, um, both the Rhode Island DEM fish trawl and the one that Jeremy Colley just talked about. These are, again, are unprecedented amounts of data that allow us then to link changes um, in nutrients and in climate to what's happening to higher trophic levels, which is, of course, essentially important. Essentially important. I'm going to shamelessly plug the work that I've been doing um, in Narragansett Bay, excuse me for that, but I do think it's important. Um, so um, I've been, like I said, measuring benthic fluxes. Uh, I started my dissertation with Scott Nixon on this, and I have not let it go. So we've been measuring for over 12 years, and we continue to do so with funding from Rhode Island Sea Grant and the Coastal um, Institute, and that somehow got flipped upside down. Um, but at two different stations north of Jamestown and one just south of, the, of Fields Point. Um, here I'm showing you um, either denitrification or end fixation. So up here, if it's positive, it's end removal. If it's down here, it means it's end addition to the sediment. I haven't updated it in a few years, but stay tuned. It's coming. Along with these data, we've got sediment oxygen demand, nutrient fluxes, and we just got funded from Rhode Island Grant to do some organic and inorganic benthic flux work. So I think together we have this amazing resource to build on. <clears throat> okay, in my last few minutes, um, I wish I had a billion dollars, because <clears throat> if I did, I would give it um, to, to, to try to understand this process. Maybe not all of it, but, um, <laughs> but a good chunk of it. Um, so I think one of the things that we, we could do that would be really fantastic is to work on getting the mesocosm facilities back up and running here at GSO. Um, with funding from the Dean's Office, Candace Obiad has been successful um, with Steve Granger's help in doing this for the lagoonal mesocosms. And this is a, an old school diagram of it, which um, highlights sort of what Steve was talking about earlier with seagra a seagrass um, experiment. But these are right down here. You can check them out. They're near the pump station. Um, and the lagoon mesocosms allow us to answer questions in more shallower systems. And then these larger merle tanks, which are such a fantastic resource, we could use them to begin to test the future. So we don't really have time to wait around, right, 5, 10, 15 years to get some answers. But we could come together and build these resources out again. And then we could answer some of these questions that people were posing. We could test our future. We could ask, what kind of baseline do we want? How would we get there? We could say, what's driving the species changes in the bay? Candace has been working on that in the lagoon mesocosms. Um, you know, what's happening with the lobsters? Are scuppers? Feeding them. We, will, we have plans to do some oyster work with lobsters in the lagoon mesocosms. Um, but I think some sort of combination like this would not only allow us to specifically test questions we have, but it's also a wonderful education and outreach tool because we can bring people in to see what we're doing. We can monitor the, we can set this up with real time monitoring so people can go online and see like the daily metabolism of these systems and how if we add nutrients and change temperature or add different fish species, I'm almost done, um, what that will do. So I really, I would be if I had a billion dollars. <clears throat> okay, finally, um, before I finish, I just want to say how excited I am that so many people are here today. Um, I, can't under, I can't really overemphasize the importance of the eyes on the bay. So people working on, the, working on Narragansett Bay, either recreating or actually working, right? They are the eyes on the bay, and they can provide, and you guys can provide information that we don't get. You have a historical knowledge that we don't have. You have an intimate knowledge of the bay that we don't have. And as we have things like harmful algal blooms, a new kelp um, aquaculture, or oyster aquaculture developing, all these new species coming online, the role of citizen science is really important. So along with that billion dollars, what else I would do is I would get an I would start to implement a real citizen science monitoring program where everyone on the bay would have a, a place to go to to enter information that would help us understand so whale everything from whale sightings and seal sightings to changes in phytoplankton composition. So my hopeful message is together we can tackle this. The future is of course change and it will be unexpected, but I think I think we're in a good position to uh, to do this together. Thank you. Thank you, Wally. Wenley, as our rapporteur, um, what question would you like to pose or thoughts? It's, sure. I guess, two part. Um, today, a lot of the focus has been on nutrient imp inputs and reduction from wastewater treatment plants. And I'm curious uh, the, what your thoughts are on the effects of nutrient inputs from subwatersheds. We focused a little bit on salt pond data and little Narragansett Bay data, um, realizing some of our sub watersheds and, and those uh, salt pond watersheds are impacted more by nutrients coming from the watersheds runoff, uh, wastewater from septic systems. And how important is 
that connection to the issues we've been talking about today with regards to the change in productivity of the Bay. And then the second part of the question is, how is the change in precipitation and the delivery of that precipitation going to affect our efforts to combat nutrient pollution from stormwater, realizing it might be more difficult um, when we are trying to manage stormwater that's being delivered in the dead of winter with no um, vegetation to help remove those pollutants. Sure. Just use the microphone um, if you can, John. A couple, a couple of things in, in terms of, uh, I, I, I've, I've got to say, if I had a billion dollars, I'd give it to you. Thank you. Hey, Bruce, can I have a raise? Yeah. Bruce could give me a raise. Can, uh, then I might have more of the. I got part of a billion. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, um, ba basically. Wait, it wouldn't yeah. actually take a billion dollars. Oh. Just realistically, <laughs> if we ever want to sat down budget wise. Bruce wouldn't give me a billion dollar raise. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, um, the the bay and the salt ponds. I, I think you got to say those those are two different things because groundwater probably is the dominant source of nutrients to a lot of the salt ponds, and we don't know whether it's it's an important source. We treat it as if it's not. Um, we should figure that out. So that that's part of the answer is you got to one size doesn't fit all in in uh, these things and. I think the, um, the other, you know, part of this question is that we don't design our infrastructure for the climate of the future. We design it for the climate usually of the last 20 years or something along those lines with maybe a little thought toward what might happen. So all of our infrastructure is designed for the climate that existed in the past and it's going to be overwhelmed by the climate that um, is going to happen in the future. A 30 percent increase in precipitation when you factor in the, that it's going to come in much more extreme events which overwhelm the infrastructure, that's a big deal. Okay, <clears throat> so for groundwater and the, yeah, so for sure John's absolutely right that there's the coastal salt ponds and Narragansett Bay are, yeah, two different, two different animals here. Um, and I do think that they, that's like a whole separate workshop that, that Sorry, Jen. Um, that could that could happen, and that I think would be important to do so. I think groundwater is definitely more important than the salt ponds. I think in Narragansett Bay, the last I read on that is that for at least uh, most of the bay, it's thought um, that the balance we're trying to do the water balance and whatnot, that the groundwater is not important, um, according to Art Gold's work. And then I think, Chris, you might have some work that says towards the maybe lower part of the Marianne Bay, groundwater may be important, I think, if I'm remembering that correctly. Um, but overall, I, I think that it's probably a lower proportion. Um, I think that was one question. And the other question is about the rain. I think that um, for sure, flashing precipitation means that we have a higher amount likely of urban runoff coming in and how that then gets captured and, and dealt with is important. It's going to be important for the subwatersheds and the coastal ponds for sure. I also think that the issue with some precipitation changes coming in like that, more intense storms, means that the water coming into say like Providence River Estuary may flash in and provide a lid over the, over the salt water and then that will decrease um, the ability for mixing, increased stratification, and potentially lower oxygen conditions as the metabolism occurs underneath there. Um, so I think that's a, a, a physical change that can, that can um, maybe even overshadow with some of the nutrient reductions depending on how big those storms are and when they come. Okay. Thank you. Should we open it up to questions from the attendees? Uh, do we have a microphone runner? Okay, great. <laughs> Yes, sir. Up, right up there. Uh, John, uh, you were doing core sediments. Did you do anything with the chloramines and the chloridanes as far as their increase and decrease over the years? Yeah, there, there's actually been a, a fair amount of work done on contaminants, both uh, heavy metals and organics. And, you know, that sort of showed up on that first summary diagram, which is from uh, uh, Pesh et al. It's an EPA thing, and it, and it shows it starting in the kind of the mid to late 1800s. Contaminants went way up, and they got to pretty high values, and then after Clean Air, Clean Water Act in the 70s and some other regulatory action, they've been coming down slowly. So uh, there's, a, there's a positive trend in that regard. That 
sediment quality is improving. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, just interested, in, I'm just interested in the chloramines and the chloridanes. I mean, we started with the chlorine when, so it should be in the sediments. True? Yeah. Is there any kind of a chart that we can go by to see if there's been an increase or a decrease of these chloramines and, and chloridanes over the years? Um, and the course. Yeah, and, and, and uh, yeah, I don't have that to show you. Okay. But yeah, there is data along those lines. It'd be interesting, I think, to find out if there is an increase to deal with probably problems that are coming down the road. That's my own personal opinion. Question over here. We are going to go back and forth on each side of the room. Check your fitness tracker at the end of the day. This is uh, both for uh, John and for, for Wally. Um, the nitrogen reductions from the wastewater treatment plants have really um, been implemented over the last less than 10 years. So we've seen a dramatic reduction. And there has been a lot of concern of, uh, from a biological point of view, not seeing an expected immediate response, particularly in the upper bay. And so my question for you both is what, if you had to design an experiment or a, a research um, uh, roadmap for how, how we might anticipate uh, how we might understand and anticipate future changes from uh, nitrogen reductions that have already been implemented, what would be the top one, two, or three kind of tracks you'd pursue to understand that question? Well, well the, the, the first thing I would say, and then uh, in terms of specific uh, experiments, I'm going to throw that one at you. Wally's absolutely right. We need to try this stuff in the tank because earlier I heard what, what I described as geoengineering. Now, as soon as we built wastewater treatment facilities, we started geoengineering. We just didn't call it that. So we've been doing it for 120 years, but we didn't do it on purpose. And, you know, at some point we figured out that, you know, this wasn't necessarily uh, all, all good and there was a lot of bad. So you can't really start just messing with what the wastewater treatment facilities are doing without understanding how the system works. And we don't really completely understand how the system works. And that's where playing in the tanks comes in handy. You know, if you screw something up in the tank, that, you drain it and you try again. You, you, you trigger some sort of a threshold effect in the bay that is an unintended thing. You know, the, the, I, I don't know what the, uh, the repercussions of that would be, but they would be pretty significant. Yeah, I think they would be, and I, and I think um, that's a huge question, <laughs> and I don't really know where to begin, um, except to say that I think there are a series of questions. I think it would be first served to go back to the original moral experiments, um, and from there, I think we could begin to do some some basic things, asking questions about some of this, uh, this idea that Candace brings up, this Goldilocks scenario. You know, where is this combination of nutrients and temperature that fits for us? And additionally, we've got to be able to do this in a way that allows us to ask, like John was talking about, not about the past 20 years, but looking forward to the first 20, to the next 20 years or, or 50 years. And so I think sort of, um, I would do a series of com a combination series of um, temperature and nutrient experiments. And then I think there's, um, which Candace has gotten me quite interested in, there's a whole series of, of, I of ideas to explore about predator-prey relationships and how those would shift. And then you had both of those going and we got everyone working on this together, I think, yeah. Bright future. Yeah, well, and, and one, one thing that's really interesting is that real simple experiment that's occurring over in the narrow river where there's no grazing uh, that kind of leads you in one direction, and then if you understood how the bay system works and how phytoplankton productivity, it's a question in my mind is, okay, is it so much that the productivity is going down or can we not measure it accurately because of grazing? And I don't know the answer to that question, and that's kind of fundamental. That's fundamental. We've had some of the earlier moral experiments looked at some of the change in grazing, and then there's this whole idea too, like there's a grazing I mean, they produce fecal pellets, right? So they've got to go to the bottom, and yet when we measure the benthic fluxes, they're, they're typically much decreased. And so uh, understanding that water column, that benthic pelagic coupling, and how that's shifting, I think, is important. We have time for one more uh, question. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up to that because I think the Merle experiments would be great. Uh, one thing that we're, there's a little bit more complexity in the bay, and 
one of the things we've been running is these ecosystem models on top of the physics models that we're running. And the, we're testing all the different parameters to see which one controls most the, f the size of a bloom. And one of the things we're seeing is that certain areas of the bay contribute great, great zooplankton. And in the models, that's the single biggest control on the size of the blooms that we produce. Like, and in particular, the grazers that are coming out of Greenwich Bay in the model, have, they exert an influence on blooms as far north as Phillipsdale. So that's a model. It's only a model. But you, just, you, have to, you can't just do the Merle experiments. You have to take into account that there might be other, other factors coming in from all different parts of the bay. It's, but I, I just think it's interesting. Grazers are a huge question. So, Chris, I, I do think that's important, and I think that one of the power, powerful things of mesocosms is it allows you to ask mechanistic questions that then can, can then go directly into the models that you want to run, right? And I think that, that makes that a powerful combination, so. Any last comments from the panel before we move on? Please join me in thanking our panel. <laughs> Jen's going to lead us through what's next. Thank you. Okay, so we're probably going to get out early if you all stick with me, all right? So we, we need the graduate students who help during lunch to come up and upload your, um, your template. Um, if you want to just get up, stretch your legs, or there are some more cookies and a couple more pieces of pie out there. But let's uh, regroup in about five, ten minutes. to the latest and best science going on. Uh, I mentioned first thing in the morning that Sea Grant has been funding research in and around Narragansett Bay uh, for its entire 50 years. That's the uh, one constant in these studies. But as we've heard, the issues are changing. They're, they're definitely evolving. And we want to make sure with the um, limited funds that we have, that we're focusing in areas that all of you uh, think are really important. So the exercise that we went through at lunch today with this esteemed panel to my right uh, was to ask uh, uh, all of you to come to them to help formulate research questions that we might tackle. Um, and we are recording this. We are keeping our notes because this is how we're going to make our uh, funding decisions based on what we're going to be learning uh, in the next short period of time. So um, with that, Jen, do you have anything to add in terms of work? <laughs> All right. There you go. Okay. So we, um, by the way, uh, Wally, I am looking for the billion, uh, but that's going to take a significant effort with Congress. But, you know, let's, <laughs> we'll try. We'll do what we can. So why don't I turn to the person I know best on my right here, uh, Dean Corliss. What did you find out? Thank you, Dennis. Um, just a quick comment. I think the conversations we've had here uh, meet and actually exceed our expectations today. So uh, I think it's been very productive all the way around for uh, the conversations we've had. So uh, our group um, had a, a rather dynamic discussion and came up with a number of suggestions. Um, the first was, what are our goals for process and, and methods? The idea of how, how do we approach moving forward, uh, how do we set goals, uh, react to information um, based on values, beliefs, and ethics, uh, trying to get some sense of how to determine um, what those goals are in the future and, and how do we get there. Um, and along those lines, how do we create a moral imperative for the Bay of Stewardship uh, in, a, in addition to the other drivers? The idea that uh, this is a um, important uh, natural resource that we need to steward going forward. Uh, the next topic was the, the healthy bay and what is the definition of a healthy bay to all the different stakeholders. And we've talked a little bit about that uh, this morning uh, and uh, a successful healthy bay uh, by one group might be different from, from another. So how, how do we develop that to develop a consensus uh, amongst uh, the community to, uh, to address the future uh, in terms of the changing uses and, and changing environmental conditions. Uh, 
the next topic was um, one that's been touched on um, a bit. Uh, John uh, mentioned that as well. How do we uh, engineer the bay or do geoengineering if that is desirable? Certainly John made a case that that really started uh, with uh, earlier work. And so then the question is, uh, is it desirable to try to tweak that, to change that? Uh, and if so, uh, do we run the experiment in the bay or as has been suggested by Wally uh, and John, do we use uh, Merle tanks or Merle-like tanks to run those experiments? I, I think those are very good questions uh, and related to this whole idea of geoengineering. A um, couple of things, uh, the timing of the nutrient release, which came up this morning, uh, which may affect uh, the, uh, the impact of the nutrients, and how do we benefit all users of the bay if we do consider geoengineering? So it's a, a topic that uh, perhaps hasn't been explored as much uh, in the past, but perhaps would be timely to consider uh, as, as uh, we move forward. Uh, the next slide. Um, so there was a thought that there was a need to re redefine policy and governance to remove barriers to proactive habitat restoration. Uh, so the idea being that there's no legal mandate at the moment for restoration. Uh, so it, it's looking at uh, barriers uh, to that restoration, and there's going to be a, another aspect that we'll bring in, uh, I think, in the third slide. Um, and what are the overriding issues that impact all stakeholders in Narragansett Bay? Um, we certainly have addressed that uh, today, but uh, to be able to come together in some uh, sort of summary consensus as to what those issues are. Uh, Oh, this is uh, an interesting one, is what is our future with changing regulations? This relates to what I was just referring to about the, the, the barriers uh, and governance issues. What's, what is our future with changing regulations and uncertainty within our political system? So we're talking of right now about uh, EPA regulations that exist. Uh, what happens if that changes in the future? Uh, and there is some uncertainty about the regulatory environment, uh, and so that would certainly have an effect on our discussions uh, about the May moving forward. And how do we make all this information accessible to everyone, including uh, all the stakeholders? So uh, the, uh, the question was that we have a lot of information here um, that has been covered and will be covered in the future. So how do we uh, communicate that to a large, the larger community? Uh, what's the effective way to, to do that? And finally, the third slide is, would it be useful to have this meeting in different locations? Uh, the idea of being going to other locations in uh, Rhode Island to, um, to bring in uh, additional people, uh, as well as would it be uh, useful to have these sort of meetings on different topics related, but different topics, a different uh, foci going forward. Uh, and certainly um, the Spared Symposium is a great example of how we can do that. So uh, those were two questions that related that came up. Uh, is shellfish growth rate and re or reproductive rate changing? Um, and can we compare this to historical growth rate studies? So basically uh, some benthic uh, work that was being uh, suggested. Um, is it possible and beneficial to test effluent effect on bay species. So uh, this came up uh, about the species uh, that, that are being used uh, to uh, sort of the, the metrics. And um, the question was, well, would it also be useful to look at the bay species just to see uh, directly what their eff the effect uh, is, not necessarily as an uh, EPA metric, but just to, to, to understand what that metric is for some of the impacts. Um, and finally, what is the role of the benthic environment in the bay and how is it changing? And that was touched upon by, um, by Steve and, and others, uh, the suggestion that um, benthic uh, productivity or generation uh, can be potentially important uh, and uh, that would be an area for future uh, study going forward.
that's quite a list, and that's just from one, one group. One, pie. one yeah, yeah, in one pie. All that from one pie. The chocolate pie. Was it the chocolate pie? Yes. Oh, well, it was the chocolate pie. There was the most sugar involved. Uh, Angela, would you like to take the mic next? Oh, it was apple. <laughs> I don't think it was as popular as chocolate, but it wasn't me. People didn't want to talk to you. Um, uh, hopefully we captured uh, the questions we did here pretty well, but um, there were some questions about uh, more work. There's some work going on, but more work to create a local market for seafood that's harvested in Rhode Island. I remember reading on Sarah's website, I think, about how dogfish get shipped across the world, and we don't eat it much here. seems kind of crazy, all the environmental resources that go into something like that. So how can we encourage local use more? Um, in terms of policy, are, are there any management barriers to uh, using what's being caught locally? Um, there was a question on the a similar question that came up in the prior session is, uh, should we change the indicator species that we currently use for toxicity testing to either better reflect changing organisms in the bay or to better uh, capture changing chemicals? Um, I think one of the difficult questions is chemicals are changing all the time, substitutions when PFOA is right now is firefighting foam, so they go to a different chemical. That doesn't necessarily mean it's better. It's just one that hasn't been studied yet and the chemical industry came out with. So, you know, do you pick a list of specific chemicals to test for or do you come up with perhaps more types of whole effluent toxicity tests that would test additional toxic effects? Um, and I think that's uh, one way of looking at the novel, are there novel chemical species that we haven't looked for that are relevant? Um, key sources of the non-point solution, pollution in the bay, and how do we get a handle on nutrient loading from that source? Um, are HABs considered a water quality or human health issue? Where do they fall in terms of future management? Uh, sorry. Uh, how can we create a better ecological and regulatory approach to support aquaculture industry? I think this was along the lines of helping it get off the grounds, uh, get off the ground. I think the Bay Samp is looking at um, that issue coming up, trying to streamline the process, identify potential conflicts ahead of time, that sort of thing. Um, is the Bay surviving on treatment plant effluent? What's the significance of offshore versus um, anthropogenic nutrient contributions within the bay, and how has that shifted? Uh, is there a significant difference in productivity between the ocean water and the lower bay? If so, why, and could biofouling help answer the question? I think earlier this morning we heard two different opinions on whether there is or isn't biofouling in a relatively similar area, so are there some localized um, reasons for that, or are there more global reasons that we could study? Uh, would increased substrate, substrate sorry, in areas with poor bottom structure facilitate the bay recovery and improve biomass? Um, if we removed anoxic sediments, would this speed up the remediation of uh, those sediments and the communities associated with them? And what would be good biological mo uh, measures that we could undertake that would respond more directly to water quality and less to sort of regional fisheries changes um, that we've been talking about, and how can we better incorporate those into our program? Great. Thank you, Angela. Mike? Just want to add in here, I think, you know, most of us are aware of the fact that Narragansett Bay is one of the most studied places in the United States and certainly the world because not just of GSO, but our partners at Roger Williams University, at Brown University, uh, and, and even so, we are now, an exercise like this is showing us how much we don't know about our favorite place. Okay. Um. Green, the next slide. Further. Further. One more, Seth. There we go. There we go. Okay. 
how do we how do changes in nutrient discharge and bloom dynamics impact menhaden and other uh, planktivorous fish? Uh, certainly, we've seen um, an influx of menhaden, the likes of which we haven't seen in in many years. And uh, you know, what is the impact? Um, how does fall Atlantic herring harvest efforts outside of Narragansett Bay impact other forage fish undergoing seaweed migrations? Um, on my Facebook page, I have a picture up right now of a lone fisherman at Beavertail Point with two rods out. And in the distance, there's a, a series of eight trawlers working the front of the bay. Um, what impact does that have on uh, perhaps uh, uh, river herring uh, that are staging and uh, migrating. So I think we need to look at that more closely. How has the influx of warm water species, in particular black sea bass, impact the food web and native species abundance in Narragansett Bay? Of all the changes I've seen in over 50 years of diving, I have to say that the influx of black sea bass uh, a species of fish that was almost unheard of back when I was first diving is nothing short of uh, an infestation. I mean, they literally exist everywhere. Uh, talk to fishermen and they'll tell you how aggressive they are. Now, how can such a ferocious feeder not be impacting the entire ecosystem? particularly if you're pulling these fish up and even small black sea bass are stuffed to the gills with crabs and lobsters. So yes, water has warmed and that perhaps has a significant impact on lobsters, but certainly a, a species that preys on them in such great numbers is gonna have an impact. Um, how can Rhode Island adapt and take advantage of ecosystem changes through adaptive fishing regulations and other economic endeavors? Uh, example, uh, you know, whale watching, um, seal watching, and so forth. Are significant levels of herbicides entering Narragansett Bay as runoff, and how many, uh, or how may they impact uh, microalgae and seagrass? Uh, we all know about Roundup and now it's considered a carcinogen. What's it doing to seagrass? Can we, in fact, introduce a more heat-tolerant strain of eelgrass? How can we expand tagging efforts to better understand fish habitat use and vulnerability? How has the increase in aquatic birds, cormorants namely, impact the food web? What is the right level of nitrogen reduction and does the level change by season? Uh, Bioeconomic analysis of the trade-off between ecosystems and user outcomes. How can we better protect our salt marshes against sea level rise and other impacts of climate change? Uh, Corinne and Lanny, I think, are next. Sure. Okay. Yours are in a different file. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, we had a few questions. They were, a lot of them were um, scientific type questions um, and related to a lot of the talks that were given today. So the first was, is that, are there quantifiable targets for nutrient levels in Narragansett Bay? So we can, can we define a specific range um, that works for all users in the bay? Second was quantifying changes to the nutrient budget, bu nutrient budget in the bay. Uh, this relates to Wally's talk for sure. But how will relative concentrations of nutrient species change? What are the effects on the seasonal timing of nutrient fluxes? And then how will the relative importance of different nutrient sources change over time? Um, next, we have studying other types of vegetation and habitats. So we had a couple people in our group who were concerned with um, rock grass and with kelp beds and how those 
the distribution of those will change over time and how that's driven. Um, a lot of people had some observations that they had specifically that weren't necessarily expected with regard to eelgrass distribution and some other species. So kind of um, investigating the distribution of all different types of aquatic vegetation and why they're distributed the way that they are. All right, what happened to the cancer crabs and lobsters in Narragansett Bay? So there are changes in abundance over time. What were the main drivers there? What are the main drivers there? Um, and I guess you could ask that about a lot of different species groups, but that was our main, main one. And then finally, this is similar to some other questions we've had as well. Uh, chlorine and sodium bisulfate specifically, but byproducts of wastewater treatment, um, their specific effects and some of the byproducts from that treatment, uh, what are their long-term effects and what are the effects of certain chemicals that we're not um, directly testing? All right, so that's all I have. Uh, Matt? Just one slide. This was chocolate cream pie, by the way. Okay, so we just had a, a couple questions. Um, so do the low levels of chlorine and sulfate effluent from the wastewater treatment facilities have a cumulative negative effect um, or ecological effects in the bay? So getting at what is the half-life of these, these um, chemical species even at low levels? Uh, what would happen if we replace all chlorine treatment with UV? Should we be monitoring sediment pH levels at specific locations where dissolved oxygen is low, and we know that the water column is hyperneutrified. And how are the sediment pH levels that are observed within these sites affecting larval recruitment of our bivalves? So particularly in the wild harvest, not so much in the farm settings with the uh, adult populations. And for a given location, not necessarily bay-wide, uh, what is a range of nitrogen levels that are adequate for the primary production to main maintain shellfish growth and reproduction. So really this is kind of the uh, golden key question. And another um, topic that came along with this was, you know, earlier in the day someone had asked, what are we at an appropriate level for adequate production for fisheries in the bay? And an answer was given, well, if our shellfish are growing, I think we're doing pretty well. So should shellfish be a sentinel species of adequate primary production? They're in the upper water column or the midwater column and are getting the first crack at the phytoplankton. What's happening at the benthic level um, with the nutrients at the benthic level for our invertebrates? And what is the golden key to that if we could ever find it? So what are the upper and lower thresholds that have become dangerous uh, to bivalves? Oh, next slide, actually. I just talked about that top one on the slide and the second one. So how does Rhode Island sound nutrient sources compare to anthropogenic sources? So comparing the nutrients coming in from our wastewater treatment facilities and our freshwater and groundwater compared to that coming in from uh, Rhode Island sound. And uh, Melvin, I think you have one question as well. Melvin's been slaving away down here as a volunteer, and I really appreciate it. And he has been listening to all the presentations and whatnot. And, I, and of all the things that um, you guys have all covered, Melvin just has, I think, one or two that he'd like to share with you all that, I, that maybe haven't um, been highlighted. So I just want to say how much I appreciate you. Thank you. Um, I think most of the questions that I managed to take notes on were pretty much highlighted uh, previously, but I just wanted to point out to the last question here, which is more of in the social science realm, um, and that is what are the socioeconomic impacts of losing Rhode Island's fishing industry and cultural identity, uh, uh, and particularly 
what are these effects, uh, if, if are these uh, effects felt uh, in other sectors of Rhode Island's economy, such as tourism? Um, I think that was a very important question that was raised uh, earlier and that needed to be brought up and back again. Thanks very much, Melvin, and thanks to all who worked on these. It'll be uh, an interesting job we have consolidating and getting them organized and structuring an appropriate RFP. But fortunately, we're not alone. I'd like to thank this group of people and welcome up the next panel with Tiffany Smythe to, to moderate, uh, who will talk about, who will introduce the other players in moving forward on Narragansett Bay future. Tiffany. All right, as we are rolling right into our last panel, feel free if you need to step out real quick. We're just gonna um, start in a moment here. And we need Connor and Lou and Dave and John King. Where is John King? In just a moment, I'll actually just, no worries. In just a moment, I'll, I'll mention some of the next steps to you, which involve that as well. Ah, oh, there's John, perfect. John, we're starting. Um, we were going to start with Connor. Well, is that how you have it organized? Yeah, the list I have was Connor first, but if that's how, yeah. Switch it to Connor then. Just so we can go left to right. I don't need a. Uh, if, he's, if, you've, if you're on it, then that's fine. We'll go with Lou first. That's fine. All right. Um, folks, thank you for everything today, for um, getting here early, for being active participants. Um, for those of you who I don't know, my name is Tiffany Smythe. I'm a marine research associate here at the Coastal Resources Center and an extension specialist with Rhode Island Sea Grant. Um, really appreciate all of you being here today and contributing your great ideas. Before we launch into our last panel today, and I introduce my panelists, just, just a couple of comments. Um, Really, overall today, we've been trying to have this broader conversation about Narragansett Bay involving both citizens and scientists and thinking about how the bay has changed, what the future is, where we're going next. And I just want to reiterate some things that Jen brought up earlier this morning, how really fortunate we are here in this group to have this level of engagement and commitment and knowledge and expertise uh, to our bay. Uh, some of you who know me know I'm not from here. I'm from the New York City area, and I've worked in New York Harbor and Long Island Sound. We do not have in those places this same level of commitment to Narragansett Bay, the same level of knowledge coming not just from scientists or agency folks, but also from citizens, users, fishermen like Lanny and Al. Um, so we're really lucky. This is why I came back to Rhode Island um, and I'm just glad to see this energy today. And as we launch into this last panel, I want us to think about how to leverage those unique opportunities and strengths that we have. We have a great deal of programs here in Narragansett Bay that you're gonna hear about that are opportunities for us to respond to the research questions and gaps that we've discussed today. We have challenges, but we have things we can use to begin to respond to those challenges. So we're gonna approach this last session thinking about it from that perspective, okay? Uh, so with that, I'm just gonna briefly introduce our four panelists. They are each then going to share with you a little bit of information about um, recent or ongoing or new work that is responding to some of these Narragansett Bay questions and issues. And then we'll have a bit of a discussion about, about how we can best leverage those moving forward. So I've got, from left to right, I've got Dr. Connor McManus from uh, Rhode Island DEM, Department of Marine Fisheries. I've got Dave Butel from the Coastal Resources Management Council. I've got Dr. John King, um, Professor of Oceanography here at GSO, and Dr. Lou Rothstein, also a Professor of Oceanography. 
And with that, I'm going to hand it over, and I believe we're beginning with Lou first. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay, thank you for this opportunity. I wanted to uh, give you an introduction, a very brief introduction to a brand new program that has just been funded by NSF. Uh, we're calling it uh, Rhode Island Sea AIM, and you can see the name up there, the acronym is Sea AIM. Uh, it is uh, actually a, uh, those are the uh, PIs, co-PIs. It's actually a, a collaboration between eight of the Rhode Island institutions of higher education. There they are. We're the lead institution at URI, uh, Brown University, Bryant University, Providence College, all the, all the universities except for CCRI and uh, Johnson and Wales are a part of this. And so uh, we're very excited about this and for very good reason. It's a very large program. We just started in September. So there's no scientific uh, results that I can present to you here, but we have $19 million from NSF and another $3.6 million from Rhode Island Stack over the next five years. And so significant resource that we have available to us uh, addressing uh, the questions that we've asked throughout the morning, throughout this whole session about Narragansett Bay. Okay, so um, we have a goal, and uh, it's a pretty, pretty broad one, but it's an important one. Uh, there it is to understand how both anthropogenic and natural, and natural stresses impact ecological interactions and responses within Narragansett Bay. That's our overall goal. We have a, a, a couple of different approaches for that. First, we're going to observe the bay, and uh, that's saying we're going to continue to observe the bay, building upon the uh, long record of, of observation in, the, in our bay. We have a uh, 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 new network sensor array that we're going to be calling the Bay Observatory. Uh, the locations of those new sensors are going to be in the East Passage uh, at the uh, Plankton Time Series and in Greenwich Bay. And especially Greenwich Bay will be devoted to, to benthic flux studies. Okay, and that's, uh, I think, uh, Wally's made that point very clear. Uh, we're trying to close budgets, and so uh, clearly uh, one, of the, one of the budgets, the flux budgets, is the bottom into the water column and vice versa. All right, so we're going to be also developing new sensor technologies uh, through our chemical engineering group, uh, both at Brown University and URI, uh, nano sensors and living biosensors. And the goal here is to um, eventually uh, augment and replace the very expensive observatory equipment we're going to put in. We're going to be investing about $600,000, $700,000 in year one for new uh, observatory instruments in the bay. And the idea here is that uh, these new sensor technologies will be able to recreate those observations uh, at a, less, a much less expensive uh, cost. And so there the goal is to begin covering the bay uh, both spatially and temporally much better than we can at only isolated points. For example, the, the flux measurements we take in Greenwich Bay are great for Greenwich Bay, rather they represent it over the entire bay. We're going to try to uh, build sensor technologies that can help us cover the bay in, in a much better spatial and temporal uh, uh, framework. We also have a very strong effort in predictive and process modeling, two distinctly different approaches to modeling, what I'm calling genes to ecosystems. We have a multi-scale biogeochemical, uh, uh, ecological circulation modeling approach that's all coupled. Very, very difficult, uh, but very essential. Again, the mention uh, of the um, Merle facility uh, is an important one, and I think Chris hit the nail on the head. You'd like to be able to... Uh, uh, have that in association with models and also a Bay Observatory to help inform the modeling and the modeling help inform the Bay Observatory interactions. And so one would like to take some of the processes we can understand in the modeling uh, and, and uh, build better observatories and vice versa. We're also going to have a very important piece of uh, modeling that's going to be trying to couple all of that with socioeconomic modeling. We have a very talented group uh, at URI and throughout the state, uh, social scientists, they're going to help us uh, various surveys and try to quantify what it means when we come to uh, our society, our local society, and tell them this is what we see, and they feed back and say, what can we do to change, what, what behavior are we going to uh, uh, implement to change that or help to change that, and vice versa. This is not going to be a um, uh, ivory tower uh, uh, forecasting group that's going to come down and say, here's the answer. We're going to try to get everybody and everybody in this room as well involved in this right from the beginning so we can design our models to help inform you uh, as to what you need to know. Okay. That's the third, that's the second step. Oh, the third step is off the chart here. But we are going to, uh, uh, this is important, a very important piece. All three, I think, are, are uh, legacy pieces to a program. We've got to accomplish all of these things. 
The last one is this, uh, we're calling the Royal, Royal Center for Data Discovery. We have a lot of data for many decades, and I challenge anybody to say that they have it all in one place at this point. It's not. And so we're trying to organize this in one, in one place uh, through the uh, cooperation with the uh, Brown Center for uh, Visualization and, and, uh, and Computation, as well as URI's Big Data Center. So we're going to try to do all that and bring it into one place for not just research efforts, but also for the, uh, 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 the scientific inquiry by, by our citizens. Okay, here's a very brief, uh, I'm going to, this is our schematic. I wanted to point out to you how these are organized, a very talented team. We have three, we have three uh, thrusts and one cross-cutting thrust. We have ecosystem impacts led by Bria Governor, Royal Island College, and Bethany Jenkins at URI. Uh, we have our modeling group led by myself and Baylor Fox Kemper at Brown. We have our uh, uh, sensor technology group led by Jim Twyer at URI and Jeff Morgan at Brown. And cross-cutting thrust is this visualization thrust led by Neil Overstrom at Royal, uh, Royal Island uh, at RISD. Okay, our scientific questions. So maybe this can help formulate what you're trying to do here, but this is how we what we, we thought as important, how do complex interactions between natural and anthropogenic stress, stresses affect the response of ecologically and commercially important organisms? And emphasize complex interactions. These are hard things to do. How can temporal and spatial detection of pollutants and stressors be enhanced and data made accessible to reveal ecological complexity and to improve coastal ecosystem models? And third, how does the environment affect humans and how can a human behavior and responses be modified to improve coastal and economic sustainability? Those are our questions. We have uh, partnerships, we have other programs, we have, uh, we call them the IRM, IRMI, this interdisciplinary research and mentoring uh, initiative, uh, graduate students, undergraduate students, uh, postdocs, uh, uh, supporting junior faculty uh, at the beginning stages of their career, and equally important, this uh, last piece, academic industry community partnership. We're going to fund that, that collaboration with the uh, uh, in industry community, uh, Fisher community, and uh, other communities in this, in this state. That's an important part of what we're trying to do. Okay, our partnerships, this is the last slide. Of course, with STAC, we have, uh, we're uh, uh, collaborating with statewide STEM educational programs at Rhode Island College, at URI. We have programs that are going to be uh, uh, moving forward with other EPSCO programs. Rhode Island has a, uh, a watershed program led by Art Gold. We're going to be collaborating with him. Uh, NIH uh, has significant funding for a lot of the equipment we need to do some of our genomic uh, uh, studies and others to be determined. And again, this is a program, a statewide resource, so I'm inviting everybody in the room to talk to me and the group that's leading this program and help us understand what you need. That's it. Okay, thank you. One slide at the end of my yeah. last thing. Okay, we'll Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up is Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm here representing a couple of different entities today. Uh, first of all, I uh, want to talk about the Narragansett Bay Estuary Program, Small Grants <laughs> Program. Um, you know, we just released a, uh, a five-year status and trends report, and in that report there's 24 indicators, and in each chapter there's a, uh, a data gaps and future uh, research section. Now, we haven't prioritized these things because, as you can imagine, if you put that together for 24 different things, it runs several pages, and I don't think they're all co-equal. So, um, the Science Advisory Committee of the Narragansett Bay Estuary Program over the next few months is going to be trying to prioritize uh, research priorities moving forward. Now, um, we have some money. Uh, basically, the budget of, of the program is only about 600000 a year, and that goes to funding the staff, essentially. We have a little bit of money left over that every couple of years we roll that up and have a small grants program. Maybe that will continue moving forward, but uh, the competition for that, uh, the pre-proposals went in just a, uh, a week or so ago, and 
there'll be uh, 140k awarded in the spring in chunks of not more than 35k a piece. Now, um, next competition, if it occurs, uh, you know, basically we roll up the extra money. Uh, in the present funding climate, you know, there, that 600,000 may come in, and there might not be any extra money. Uh, you know, this is one of the things that's on the hit list, so to speak. Um, so that's the timing of it. It's intended for relatively small pilot studies. You can tell that from the size of it. Now, the important news, though, is the uh, Southeast New England program. This is the $5 million program that Senator Reed and his staff uh, were able to push through. The uh, <clears throat> geographic area of this program kind of goes from Westerly through the coastal ponds, Narragansett Bay Estuary, Buzzards Bay Estuary, and Cape Cod. So any worthy project um, in those areas is eligible. Um, they've actually had uh, one RFP last year where they awarded uh, up between one and two million dollars. They, they got another five million. And they're going to do a two-year program each year. The awards will be somewhere between one and two million per year. And the, the first RFP is going to be issued in uh, 2018. I can't really tell you what the priorities are. The, the first meeting to determine the priorities are next week. But usually there's some element of nutrients is always a priority for EPA. This is an EPA program. And I also... Uh, can tell you that Tom Ardito is the program manager, and EPA has handed this off to uh, Restore America's Estuaries to uh, uh, to run it. And my my simple form of math is I, I I do the math and I wonder what happened to the rest of the five million, but uh, I, I don't know the answer to that question. So <clears throat> so that's what I have to say today. Sure. No slides. no slides. No slides, and I don't have a whole lot to talk about. But um, what we are working on at CRMC that is just beginning now is a Bay SAMP, Bay Special Area Management Plan. The CRMC has a history of uh, developing special area management plans. The, the most, well, the current one that's being worked on is that we call the Beach SAMP, but we uh, just previous to that, we did the Ocean Samp, and there's the Greenwich Bay Samp, the Co Coastal Pond Samp. And what these special area management plans are, they give us a regulatory authority by developing enforceable policies so that we can manage the competing uses of, of those areas. And so how do you develop those enforceable policies? Well, you need to look at the science that has occurred. You need to look at the, the gaps that are, that are there for the, for the goals that you, you want in, in what you can manage. So um, one, of the, one of the needs that we see immediately for, for the Bay SAMP, um, we see s some new uses coming. The, from the offshore wind in, in industry, we have had indications that a number of cable routes want to be run through Narragansett Bay. Well, that, that's a little worrisome. It's worrisome because while in the Ocean Special Area Management Plan, we, we develop enforceable policies to address that, we're not, we're not quite so sure that we have those same policies developed for the Bay. So we want to bring the, you know, those policies up to the same standard as the, the ocean sand. The other part um, that's occurring is the Navy is, wants to enhance its uses of Narragansett Bay, and that, that will um, have effects on current users. And we want to be able to manage and work with the Navy and the, the current users so that everyone is satisfied and, and can can be content with 
with their ability to move forward with, with new and existing uses. So a, a meeting like this that's really developing, that's reviewing all of the research that's been done and <clears throat> showing some research gaps, you know, all these questions that came up is really valuable. You know, I think that as, as a group we will synth synthesize that, um, the, the research that's been done, look for the gaps, you know, from the selfish point of view or from the, the CRMC point of view, of what do we need to fill in those gaps to meet our goals? And it's a partnership with everybody here. You know, we, we, we clearly work with the university, Coastal Resources Center, DEM, other state agencies, the fishing industry, the aquaculture industry, the environmental organizations. I'm sure I'm leaving somebody out, but you know, we, that, our process is very public. There are a lot of stakeholder meetings, so, so that's what's coming in the near future. Um, hasn't really started yet. We have just received the funding, but it will be kicking off this, this winter. Thank you. So I just briefly wanted to highlight uh, some of the ongoing monitoring work that uh, DEM is responsible for and to try and put it into context of the talks we've heard today as well as uh, some of the upcoming initiatives uh, that we just heard about. Uh, so in trying to uh, protect and preserve Narragansett Bay's resources and uh, understand the health of Narragansett Bay, uh, RIDEM has a number of long-term monitoring surveys and programs to try and uh, do just that. And so from the marine fisheries perspective, we have a, over a dozen different surveys in the bay that look to try and understand how marine uh, species populations change through time. Uh, this includes uh, fin fish, crustaceans, shellfish, um, over the course of their life cycle um, at different various stages. And some of these uh, surveys dating back to uh, as early as 1979. And these are pretty critical uh, uh, surveys for us to try and understand how uh, certain um, changes in the bay have occurred and what that means for some of these upper trophic levels. From a more water quality perspective, uh, the department's put a lot of effort uh, towards trying to understand water quality changes through time and spatially within Narragansett Bay. Um, looking at ca characteristics such as temperature and oxygen, uh, pH, chlorophyll, a lot of the attributes that we talked about today. Um, and this is uh, most highlighted by uh, the the uh, fixed monitoring network sites uh, throughout the bay that's a uh, large collaboration between DEM, uh, GSO, uh, NBC, the Narragansett Bay National Marine Estuary Program, and uh, as well as most recently uh, Mass Department of Environmental Protection. And we've also done a number of other surveys that looked more spatially at a fine scale of how uh, critical habitat elements such as hypoxia have changed through time in collaboration with um, Brown, uh, Save the Bay, uh, and GSO. And so um, while these are only a few of the monitoring programs, I want to highlight them um, both because uh, in terms of you know the talks that we've heard today uh, and understanding ecosystem changes, but uh, how valuable such data is to really try and understand how the bay has changed through time. And it's imperative uh, that these types of surveys continue uh, being funded and, tr and uh, evaluated to really understand how the bay has changed. And particularly for some of the marine fishery surveys, how there's a lot of other resources that we have that can also be integrated into some of this work. <clears throat> While we've done quite a bit of monitoring, um, we still have plenty of things that we still can monitor and many research questions, uh, particularly regarding marine fisheries. And that's in part why uh, the Rhode Island Marine Fisheries Institute was established to try and improve our understanding of Rhode Island's marine fisheries resources by address addressing them with research questions um, and having research focused on Rhode Island relevant issues. Um, and this has to date been a large, largely a collaboration between DEM and GSO, but it has the input uh, from a number of different academic institutes in the state, as well as other non-government organizations, and um, almost most importantly, uh, the feedback and the response of the fishing community in helping us try and understand what are some of the pressing questions that we have to address as we move forward and how can we uh, formulate these questions and uh, with scientific research questions and address them in a systematic way and um, work towards solutions for them. 
I think one of the other attributes for DEM is we're lucky in that we can be somewhat adaptive to the evolving needs and changes uh, for the state. And I think this has been most highlighted by our recent harmful algal bloom monitoring program and how um, as this issue has uh, been a more recent concern, we've been able to get a better hold of it in terms of establishing a monitoring, monitoring program moving forward that's such a large collaboration between not just uh, multiple di divisions within DEM, but uh, Department of Health, um, some researchers here at GSO, as well as uh, the help of uh, aquaculturists and wild harvesters. So um, I think as we continue to try and face these challenges, we should think about how um, we can work in some of the monitoring efforts that we currently have into trying addressing these uh, emerging concerns. Um, from the uh, uh, fisherman's perspective, you know, I think we, there's still a lot of work to be done to try and make sure we um, better understand the changes in the bay and how they relate to as what you have, are seeing. Um, we certainly are uh, devoted to trying to incorporate more of the fisheries dependent attribute um, for, for assessing our stocks and marine resources and it's been certainly helpful at the stock assessment level and it's been something that uh, we continue and want to remain um, immersed in with other organizations including CFRF um, as well as trying to figure out how we can translate fishermen's observations in a systematic way to help complement uh, our fisheries independent data and better understand um, more holistically what's happening in the bay. So again, um, just briefly, as we kind of heard the talks today and uh, th heard of these upcoming initiatives and grant opportunities, I want to highlight the ongoing DEM work, not just to let people know what's going on currently that can be useful in terms of data and further analyses towards these questions, but also the, uh, the staff and expertise across multiple spectrums of the Bay and its resources and how that can also be integrated as we move forward. Uh, and so with that, you know, thank you for letting the department be involved in today's symposium and we look forward to collaborating both with uh, stakeholders and academics. program is, uh, is meant to uh, be run as a center, and so the um, funding will be decided as we make progress uh, moving forward, and, and funding will be given to those who are making progress and taken away, so there's going to be a very dynamic system going on here. And so uh, there's a group of significant number of researchers all across the state already involved, but that's flexible. So if you don't see your name up there, there will be opportunities to, to uh, get funded through Stack. We have seed funding as well. So on the research side, we have opportunities for people to contribute, and we're looking always for great, great ideas. On the on the um, uh, on the side of the uh, uh, you know the industry side, we, we are really really serious about making sure that that fisheries and aquaculture and anybody that's that's uh, using the bay uh, for their economics uh, uh, needs get involved with us and let us know just what the issues are. So we have we're to be we're to be developing models and. And we're trying to figure out how the um, bay responds to different stressors, both natural and anthropogenic. And, um, and the, that's, that's the forcing part of it. But what, what are we trying to analyze for? And so, and so those are the kinds of things. What, what, uh, what species are we trying to understand best? How does it work? Uh, and how can we forecast that better? And what uncertainty do we have? You know, models are, most models are wrong, right? I mean, they're, they're not, <laughs> they're wrong. And so, and so the idea here is to get a system in place that can not just say what the future is going to look like according to the model, what's the uncertainty associated with that? 
And is the uncertainty actionable? Okay, if it's not actionable, then, then why isn't it? And at that point, we get feedback from the, from the uh, stakeholders that tell us what is actionable, and we can then try to get it so that we can find that uncertainty over time. So there's a lot of opportunity to, uh, for, uh, you know, for people who aren't in that program already, and most some of you are already, to join us and, and help us understand a very uh, set of important and complex issues. Thanks, Lou. That's great. I'd love to see if uh, some of the other panelists would like to respond to that, how they could work actually with Lou's program or further respond to some of the questions or opportunities that have come up today. I'm thinking about monitoring, for example. Sure. Well, I, I, I think, you know, coming back to what Wally and John had talked about earlier in terms of the, uh, the mesocosms and what that can provide, I think one nice attribute with them as well is that they're somewhat of the hybrid between the real environment and a lab setting. You know, you have somewhat of a controlled environment, but you can also have the actual influence of the day-to-day -day conditions out there. So it, it's, as, it's, it's as best as you can try and get to controlling an environment with having it simulate a natural environment. Um, and I think there's a lot of interesting questions, uh, particularly when thinking about the, you know, nutrient response to, uh, phytoplankton response to chlorophyll, uh, sorry, nutrient uh, loading and what that means and how, where is, you know, the, the relationship, is it linear, is it not, and trying to understand that dynamic um, as one of the research questions also talked about earlier, our shellfish uh, sentinel species that we should look to to understand the influence of decreased primary production and perhaps benthic, uh, benthic pelagic coupling. So I think those are some of the more, um, questions that might be uh, direct relevance to some of the discussions we had today. And I think from the monitoring, there's, there's a lot of other data from quahog abundance trends to uh, um, fish, fish trends at, you know, young of year, age ones, age twos, that, you know, can be tapped into much more to try and understand some of the issues that, you know, that Jeremy had talked about earlier in terms of where throughout a species life stage are we having some of these bottlenecks and what they might relate to. Great. Thank you. John, you spoke about, oh, no, Dave, go ahead if you're jumping in. So there. I, I would <laughs> just reinforce a little bit um, Connor's um, advocacy for monitoring, but um, from the, the shellfish industry, both wild harvest and, and aquaculture, we need to know more about the pseudonychia. We need, you know, we, we need a, a strong monitor, monitor uh, not a stronger monitoring program because it, the monitoring program we had was successful, but we need to, to learn why. You know, why is this happening and, ha and how is that going to affect the future of Narragansett Bay because it, it will affect future economic development around shellfish. Thanks, Dave, for jumping in there. And John, you had spoken earlier about the importance of monitoring, and we're hearing a lot about that here. Could you like to comment on that? Um, it's sometimes hard to justify monitoring, but given uh, the rate at which uh, the bay is changing, it's accelerated quite a lot. Mm. It, it becomes absolutely critical to, to not only monitor the bay, but to do it at a relatively high frequency. You know, in the past, there's so little resource to do monitoring that we, we often go out and we measure things about once a decade or sometimes even once every two decades, and that's not going to be adequate moving forward. The other aspect, that I, you know, changing the subject slightly, uh, knowing what I know about these programs, there's some key words here. One, one is coordination. Mm -hmm. Another one is partnership, because at least the SNEP program emphasizes the quality of partnerships. And these, these are not academic only. It, you know, you have to have uh, industry partners. You have to have partners with uh, towns. And a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the grading on the proposals is the quality of the partnership. And then, you know, the coordination piece between all these things, you know, the, the SNEP process, um, that, what, what the RFP looks like, and, you know, often when it comes out, you read it, and you read it again, and you read it again, and then you say, what the hell does that mean? And, you know, so the best approach is to form a good partnership and say, it means what we want it to do. And don't be discouraged by words that you're not particularly familiar with and you might not think that it's about what you think is important. Um, 
And, and I think SNEP is going to come out and it's going to say what it's going to say. And then Rhode Island Sea Grant, EPSCOR, and these other programs have to kind of coordinate with mm -hmm. that. Excellent. Thanks, John. Coordination and partnership are great words to open it up to our audience. I'm wondering if we have a lot of current and potential future partners in this room. I'm wondering what questions we have for our panel. Do we have a mic? Oh, great. Melvin Lanny over there. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, get back to, I think, I heard what I heard John ask earlier, Candice, Wally, and uh, maybe even Mike McGivney. And that is, it seems like we need to set a goal first. And how do we do that? How do you get the stakeholders engaged to identify the goal of what the stakeholders would like to see, and then we can talk about what we need for research needs? It seems, you know, kind of putting the cart before the horse. We need to know, obtain those goals for us, know what we're, what we're shooting for, and then go for it. Thanks. And I, and I think Wally made a very critical point, Lenny, is, mm. is that you have to have a goal that you can get back to. There is no easy way back to Neverland. And, you, you, know, I, I, you know, definitely pre-European settlement, that's definitely Neverland. Scallop time, that's probably Neverland, too. So... <laughs> Thanks, Lanny. That's great. Other questions? I'm trying to look around them. Um, all the way in the back, kind of, oh, yeah, right back, all the way back there. Yeah, sorry. Um, just a, uh, an add-on to what Lou has talked about is that um, one opportunity I think we have here is um, part of the EPSCOR thing is to put up a, a pump station, right? Is it okay to talk Absolutely. about this, Lou? Um, we're talking about putting a pump station at Castle Hill, which we would really, truly like to be uh, a very widely open facility. And the idea is that, um, if you remember those movies that Wally showed of, Kev of my student Kevin's intrusions coming into Narragansett Bay, it's important to put, a, put a, a number on this. These things are about 100 times more volume of water than, than the 2010 flood. So th these things are massive, and we don't know what's in the water. And so what we're going to do is we're uh, sitting right in front of me here, Steve Granger, who's the mastermind of this, but we're going to we're going to pump water continuously into the Castle Hill Lighthouse. And we're going to measure it for certain things, but we want to open it up to whoever wants to look at those water streams. Um, Dale, you know, if you want to know what's in that water, the idea is, you know, we're going to be pumping hopefully larvae and all kinds of things into this pump station, and it's completely open to whoever, whoever wants in, right? Is that fair, Lou? That's correct. Everything is going to be an open source in, in what we're doing, all the data we're collecting. All the models that we use, all that, all the information is open source for everybody to look at. And the last thing is, uh, I think the very first thing the modeler should do is m model the Merle experiments. Because if your ecosystem model can't match the Merle experiment, then you've got a problem. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, Chris Diacutis. Um, you have the mic really coming. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. I keep forgetting about the mic, too. I really think it's important, as Chris just said, to uh, listen to Wally and the critical needs of the experimental approach. Uh, but there's also others who have gone ahead of us. Uh, Boston Harbor removed their sewage treatment plant completely. Tampa Bay removed their sewage treatment plant. For the modeling approach, it may be useful to look at those and look at the progression. They're also, at least Boston Harbor is very well monitored because they were required to under the process. So that may help you model. Now it's a colder environment, but it's a gradient along with Tampa Bay. So you can be looking at some of these things to see, can you project well if it goes that trajectory, even though we can't get to Neverland, if they got to somewhere land, have we gotten there yet? Same species, uh, Ampelisca, uh, is big in both of those areas. And I don't know why that didn't get mentioned in terms of testing. You know, to toxicity testing used to be Ampelisca abdita, which is a native species. Is that not used anymore? <laughs> yeah, 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 that used to be All right, we have time. said tox. Sorry, John. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, Judith. This is partly a question and partly a suggestion. Uh, as I listened to all of this today, and also as I watched uh, several of the people who are here, John King is the chair, 
Warren Prell, Candace Oviatt, and a number of people who were here today who worked on the development of this 500-page technical report for the Narragansett Bay Estuary Program, which is really incredibly comprehensive. Um, it's, a, it's a real page burner, too, I gotta tell you. It kept me up all night. Um, I'm not kidding. Uh, and the, the other thing is that, however, and this Lou fits in a lot with what you're looking at in terms of um, in, in terms of really trying to coalesce a lot of this into uh, some kind of meaningful understanding of what everybody's doing, is that I really think if we could find a way to put some funding together so that we can actually do an inventory of who is doing what, because there is some duplication and there are gaps and we don't know what all of those are. And I, we're, we're a small enough state to accomplish that and to move even farther with the, the model approach of Rhode Island. So I, I really urge that and I would say that it's something that um, there are also a lot of people who couldn't be here today from, the, from CELS and from other universities and colleges around the state, as well as agencies and so forth, who would have a lot to offer. So I urge the, the point that the dean made earlier about questions regarding holding something like this where in different places for different parties and so on and so forth. I, I think it's a it's a worthwhile investment. It's not just frippery. Yeah. Thank you. We're funded to do just that for the Data Discovery Center. So we're charged with accumulating everything that we've ever, ever done and what we're going to do in the future, and that should reveal all the people who are collecting that data. So that we're, we're funded to do just that. And we, I welcome collaborations on that with anybody that wants to, wants to work with me on that. Thank you. We've got a chance for one more question. Anna has been waiting patiently. Go ahead. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, I'd kind of like to circle back to the beginning of the day. So we started the beginning of the day hearing from um, a panel of folks that I'm fortunate enough to hear from frequently um, about their observations and their data of what they see on the water over their 40 years of experience of fishing or growing shellfish. Uh, for the rest of the day, we heard from academics, we heard from state agencies, um, but we haven't heard from the fishermen again in terms of what their perspectives are after hearing all this information for where are the gaps. Um, and what I'd like to offer is an alternative approach. So we as scientists, I am a scientist, usually think about our monitoring techniques. So you put equipment out there and you monitor the environment. Um, but I would encourage us as a group, as we go forward, I would encourage all, everyone who has a new program starting to think about engaging with the industry early. I can offer um, CFRF, the Commercial Fisheries Research Foundation, um, as a connection to the industry. Um, that's something that we've done since the start. And um, I can tell you from my experience that, that engaging the industry early in terms of actually developing your research questions, they know a lot about what's going on out there and they can really help us, us as scientists refine our ideas of what's going on in there to develop a question in projects that are effective and that are um, developing solutions and answering questions um, in a reasonable amount of time. So I just wanna offer that and circle back to the beginning. Thank you. Anyone want to respond to that? All right. I agree. <laughs> Good response. All right. With that, then, um, I think we're going to wrap this up. I just want to comment that um, two, uh, two quick comments. One, that just as much as we've heard talk about how we can respond to research questions, we've also heard a lot of emphasis on that management question or that vision question. What do we want for the Bay, as well as how can we engage citizens fishermen, other users in that research. And I think those are really important notes to, to end on for today. Um, someone asked earlier, and just to mention that in terms of next steps, um, aside from these great initiatives that we're so fortunate to have in our state, uh, Rhode Island Sea Grant will be publishing a proceedings from today, and that will include a summary of all the information you've seen today, uh, these flip charts, I believe the research questions, all of that, that'll be available sometime after the new year maybe not January 2nd, um, you know, sometime soon. And uh, if, uh, our Rhode Island Sea Grant colleagues can comment more on that if you have questions. And with that, I'd like to thank our fantastic panel, and thanks for your comments.
It's my opportunity just to give a quick wrap up. I'm not going to review this incredibly rewarding day for you because it really uh, was fabulous. And uh, just a, a couple of comments, uh, uh, Lanny, when you go back to when, when did the fishermen have a chance to, you know, set some policy, I, I just refer you back to the King Charles II Charter and that, uh, that, that phrase, the citizens shall continue to enjoy their right to fish. So in any document going forward about the policy for multiple uses in the bay, I think a reminder from that seven, 1672 document uh, ought, ought to come first. And uh, we certainly hope to see it there. And Anna, uh, you know, certainly we are very thrilled to, at Sea Grant to be supporting the Quahog vessel research fleet, uh, providing valuable data to DEM so that their stock assessments can be more effective. So we, we see that partnership developing. And I know that my history on the Bay, uh, go, going back working with the Shell Fisherman's Group, with Mike's group uh, uh, 40 years ago, uh, the ability for uh, resource users and regulators and the scientist community to be sitting around one room having a civil conversation about the future in Narragansett Bay is a blessing that we didn't know 30, 40 years ago. And it's, it's a great place to be for us today. So I, I'm thrilled at the outcome, the things that we heard today, the things that we learned. Um, and this does give us some really great information to move forward. We will be cooperating with all these other programs. We'd be stupid if we didn't. Most effective use of our tax dollars. In terms of today, there were a lot of committees involved helping make sure we got the right people uh, together in this room, and I think they were very successful. Uh, this was really an outstanding day together. It, it flew by for me. I couldn't believe we were at the end of the day already. I had too much fun and they actually pay me to do this. This is really something. Um, but I do want to thank those who helped in the planning. Uh, there were also was a massive team from Rhode Island Sea Grant and the Coastal Resources Center who handled all the myriad details of even making sure the food was pretty good at lunch today. And I want to give them a big hand right now. I, I also want to give a special shout out to uh, the Dean, uh, Bruce Corliss, who, who came to us with this idea after that conversation with, with Al and said, wouldn't this be a great idea? And I said, this is a perfect concept for the Baird Science Symposium. So thanks again to Ron Baird and thanks to Bruce Corliss for bringing this to the attention, uh, us to my attention, and uh, thanks to you for that great idea that we really should get together and talk about this. Uh, it was a very useful day. And my, my obvious thanks to all the speakers today, but in particular thanks to Jen McCann, who really put it all together. Jen, thanks very much. And, and I think we've all got our marching orders going forward to make this a better Narragansett Bay. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>